This happened to me on June 6, 1999. I was a rookie cop, still green behind the ears, working the night shift out in Ashton. It's one of those blink and you'll miss it towns tucked in the foothills of the Ozarks, more known for catfish, noodling than crime scenes. Name's Eli Turner. Wife Amy is a nurse, and we had our first baby girl on the way. Point is, I had a lot to live for and a whole lot to lose. That night began like any other. Betty ends diner for my usual coffee and gossip fix, few traffic stops, nothing to raise an eyebrow. Then, around 2 a.m., it got weird. Dispatch crackled to life. A woman, hysterical, rambling about some kind of monster in the woods just off Route 9. At first, I chalked it up to a wild animal, meth head antics, or both. Still, protocol is protocol, I headed out there to investigate. The spot she mentioned was a stretch of unpaved road twisting through a dense stretch of forest, dark as pitch except for my cruiser headlights. I could feel the prickly unease on the back of my neck. I radioed for backup, but who knows how long it would take to get to my backwater patch. I got out, flashlight in one hand, gun in the other. The air was still and the woods eerily silent. And then I saw them two glowing eyes reflecting the flashlight beam about twenty feet into the tree lean. They were unlike any animal's eyes I had ever encountered, huge and a strange, acid yellow color. Heart pounding, I edged closer. The form the eyes belonged to started to come into focus, and my blood ran cold. It stood on two legs like a person, but the proportions were all wrong. It was immense, easily over seven feet tall, covered in a coarse, dark gray hide. Its legs and arms were powerfully muscled, ending in vicious claws. The head, that's what really stuck with me. Like a warped, monstrous wolf, with a huge gaping jaw filled with razor-sharp teeth. It let out a low growl, the sound vibrating through me. Frozen by a mixture of fear and utter disbelief, I stood there like an idiot, the flashlight shaking in my hand. Then it lunged. I barely registered raising my gun before I was firing, the sound echoing through the woods. The bullets must have hit something because it roared in pain and lurched backwards. I took the opportunity and ran like hell back to the cruiser. Slamming the door, I threw it into reverse and spun the wheel. As I tore back down the dirt road, I glanced in the rearview mirror. The creature was gaining fast, its yellow eyes blazing with fury. It was easily keeping pace, its form a blur in the darkness. Knowing I couldn't outrun that thing forever, I wrenched the steering wheel, swerving the car down a side track barely wider than the cruiser itself. I fishtailed through the trees, the branches scraping at the sides of the vehicle. Sweat dripped down my forehead as I prayed the narrow path wouldn't end in a dead end, leaving me trapped. Luckily, it spat me out onto a rarely used logging road. I pressed the accelerator hard, but I was running on fumes. Suddenly, the engine sputtered, coughed, and died. I slammed the heel of my hand against the dashboard in frustration. The damn thing chose now to run out of gas. A glance in the mirror and my stomach dropped. The creature was closing the gap rapidly. It was practically flying over the ground, its long strides devouring the distance, and those horrible eyes locked on my taillights. Panic clawed at my sanity. I couldn't just sit here and wait for it to tear me to shreds. Grabbing my flashlight, I stumbled out of the car and into the woods. I knew it was a fool's errand, that the dense trees offered little protection, but blind instinct took over. As expected, the monster's snarls echoed through the trees as it tracked me. I ran until my lungs burned, branches and thorns tearing at my skin. Just when I thought I couldn't go another step, I tripped, tumbling down a sharp embankment. 
I rolled until I smacked into a tree trunk hard enough to knock the breath out of me. Dazed, I lay there waiting for the beast to descend and rip me apart. But silence greeted me instead. I cautiously lifted my head, heart pounding in my ears. Had it given up? Then I heard it the unmistakable sound of sirens in the distance. My backup was finally arriving, drawn by the gunshots. A wave of relief washed over me, then promptly receded as something else dawned on me. They were going to find my cruiser wrecked and abandoned. And in these woods, who knew what kind of wild story I'd have to spin to avoid them locking me up in the psych ward? With renewed resolve, I struggled to my feet. Every muscle in my body ached, but I had to put as much distance between me and that embankment as possible before the cavalry arrived. Stumbling along, guided more by blind luck than anything else, I somehow made my way back to the logging road. Dawn was breaking as I limped back to Ashton. I must have looked a sight disheveled, clothes ripped, covered in dirt and blood mine hopefully. My story to dispatch was a mumbled mess about chasing a meth head into the woods and losing him. They clearly thought I was either lying or delusional. But I was alive, and for that, I was grateful. Aftermath the incident changed me. The townsfolk of Ashton started calling me, Monster Cop, a mix of ridicule and unease in their voices. After a while, the stares and whispers got too much. Amy and I packed up our things, our baby girl only a few months old then, and headed west. We put down roots in a dusty little town in Nevada. Life carried on, though I never spoke of that night to anyone, not even Amy. But it haunts me. Sometimes, lying awake in the dark, I see those eyes, the monstrous form. I wonder if it was a nightmare made reality, a creature of legend somehow stumbled into the backwaters of the Ozarks. Or worse, perhaps the stress cracked something in my mind, and the monster I saw was me. Years passed. Our daughters grew up, and the Ashton nightmare started to fade into a bizarre memory. Then, one night, I came home to find Amy sitting at the kitchen table, face pale. Did you see this? she asked, her voice shaking. She slid a local newspaper over to me. There, under a sensational headline, was a blurry photo of a massive, wolf-like creature and a story about a series of mysterious livestock mutilations. The locations were all within a few hours' drive of our old home in Ashton. A chill ran down my spine. Could it be? Was the monster still out there? I'm a cop, damn it. I'm meant to protect people. Could I sit idly by if others were facing the same horror that almost tore my life apart? After so long, could I go back and face it down once more? I don't have any answers yet. But one thing is for sure. There's unfinished business waiting for me back in the Ozarks. This happened to me on October 6, 1993. Back then, I was still green as grass, a rookie cop named Jonas Beck, patrolling the quiet town of Pine Ridge nestled deep in the forested hills of northern West Virginia. I was young, eager for action, the type that figured small-town life was full of speeding tickets and lost dogs. Sure, I'd heard the old whispers of folks going missing up in those woods, but chalked it up to moonshiner tall tales. Then came that night, and my whole world shifted on its axis. It started with a routine 911 call, disturbance at the old Tyler Place, an overgrown farmhouse on the edge of town known for its eccentric owner, Elias Tyler. Old Man Tyler was the town's certified crazy person, always ranting about things in the woods, howling at the moon, that sort of thing. Still, a call's a call, so I went out to humor the guy. 
I pulled up the dirt driveway and the first thing that hit me was the stench. Like rotting meat and something else, something sour and acrid. A prickle of unease went down my spine. This wasn't your regular drunk and disorderly situation. The house was dark, but there were sounds coming from the shed out back banging and low, guttural growls. Not exactly human sounding. I called for backup, then cautiously made my way around the house. The shed door was hanging open, and moonlight cut a path right across the dirt floor. I crept closer, gun drawn. And then I saw it, a hulking form hunched over something in the shadows. At first, I couldn't make it out, but as it turned towards the light, my gut clenched in icy horror. The creature was immense, well over seven feet tall, its body a grotesque patchwork of sinewy muscle and mottled gray skin stretched tight over bone. It had a wolfish head, elongated, full of razor-sharp teeth, and its eyes, God, those eyes, twin orbs of burning yellow that seemed to bore right into my soul. Elias Tyler lay in a crumpled heap beneath it, his body torn and broken. The creature let out a snarl that sent shivers down my spine, then lunged at the opening in the shed where I was standing. I fired instinctively, the shots echoing in the small space. It roared and stumbled back, a spray of dark blood on its chest. But it wasn't enough. It charged again, a terrifying blur of teeth and claws. I barely managed to dive aside crashing into a stack of old tools. It wheeled around, those glowing eyes fixed on me. I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding like a drum against my ribs. Just then, I heard the sirens. Backup had arrived. The sudden sound seemed to startle the creature. It hesitated, giving me just enough time to bolt for the open door of the shed. I didn't look back just ran for my life, the creature's snarls fading behind me. I stumbled back to the cruiser, fumbling with my keys as the other officers piled out shouting questions I couldn't answer. We stormed the shed, but found nothing. Not a trace of the monster, only poor Elias Tyler's ravaged body. I told them what I saw, my voice shaking, and I'll never forget the look of pity mixed with disbelief on their faces. They wrote it off as a wild animal attack, maybe some messed up mountain lion. But I knew what I saw. That thing was no animal I'd ever encountered. In the days that followed, I became the local laughingstock. Monster Cop was the nickname that stuck. The townsfolk figured I cracked under the pressure— or hallucinated on some backwoods moonshine. Yet, deep down, I knew the truth. And I knew something had to be done, even if no one would believe me. I started hitting the old hunting trails, keeping an eye out for anything unusual, but the woods mostly kept their secrets. One moonlit night, while patrolling the back roads, I saw something flicker at the edge of the tree line. I pulled over, grabbing my flashlight. Heart pounding, I crept into the woods, the dead leaves crunching underfoot. And there, just for a second, I caught a glimpse of those yellow eyes watching me from the darkness. A low growl echoed through the trees, and my blood ran cold. It was out there, lurking. The rest of my patrol shift was spent with my skin crawling, the sense of being watched clinging to me like a shroud. That was the moment I realized this wasn't going to end. That creature, whatever it was, I had crossed paths with it, and now it had my scent. It was only a matter of time before it decided to strike again. Fear became my constant companion. I barely slept, jumping at every shadow. Every time my radio crackled, I braced myself for the report of another mauled body, another missing person out in those deep woods. The looks from fellow officers burned worse than any monster's bite. I saw the whispers, felt the shift in how they spoke to me. 
My pleas for a proper investigation fell on deaf ears. No one wanted to entertain the notion that there was some unknown creature roaming the forests. They thought I was a liability, a danger. I began to wonder if they were right. Then came the night that changed everything. My shift was supposed to be quiet, a few traffic stops at most. But fate, it seemed, had other plans. Dispatch sent out a call. A family reported missing near an old logging trail just off County Road 12. My heart sank. I knew that trail. It wound deep into the heart of the woods, the area where I'd first seen it. Still, I couldn't ignore the call. I couldn't be the one who sat back and let others walk into that nightmare. The radio updates were grim. Search and rescue found the family car abandoned, doors open, traces of a struggle. No sign of the family of father, mother, and their young daughter. A knot of dread twisted in my gut. This was it. This was where I had to make a stand. I drove to the scene, the headlights barely penetrating the thick, clinging fog that seemed to be a hallmark of that cursed place. The other officers were there, a mix of resignation and skepticism on their faces. I told them I was going in alone, the creature knew me, wouldn't strike at a group. It was a half-truth, a desperate gamble. After some protest, they relented. One of the older deputies, Miller, pressed a shotgun into my hands. Just in case, he said, a hint of understanding in his eyes. I stepped into the woods, the shotgun feeling pitifully inadequate. Each step was agony, the rustle of leaves and the snap of twigs sounding like gunshots in the tense silence. I could practically feel the eyes on me, tracking my every move. That familiar stench, rotten acid, wafted through the trees. It took what felt like an eternity to reach the spot where the car was found. There were more signs of struggle, torn fabric, streaks of blood on the ground, and small footprints that made my stomach churn. There was nothing to do but follow the trail deeper into the darkness. That's when I heard the whimper, faint and muffled as if from a distance. Panic surged through me. It was the little girl. I ran, stumbling over roots and rocks, the whimpers growing louder. Then I burst into a small clearing, and the scene that unfolded has haunted my nights ever since. The creature held the girl in its massive claws, her small form limp and unmoving. I saw the streaks of blood on her clothes, her pale face. The monster was crouched over something else, its back to me. As it turned, I saw it was devouring the remains of her parents, its muzzle smeared with blood. Rage and despair warred within me. I raised the shotgun, aiming at its head. The roar it let out was deafening, and it dropped the girl, charging straight at me. I fired once, twice. The buckshot tore into its chest, and it staggered, but kept coming. Just as its claws were about to rake across my face, a gunshot echoed from behind me. I whirled around to see Miller and a few of the other deputies at the edge of the clearing, weapons raised. A volley of gunfire echoed through the trees, and the creature finally faltered, crashing to the ground with a shuddering thud. Numb with shock and horror, I approached the girl. Mercifully, she was still alive, whimpering and scared, but alive. I scooped her into my arms holding her tight as the world dissolved into a blur around me. Aftermath, the incident was a bloodbath. For dead, including the creature, its existence now impossible to deny. I was hailed as a hero, albeit a haunted one. The aftermath wasn't the clean-cut victory you see in movies. News crews swarmed the town, scientists descended upon the creature's body. Theories abounded about what it was and where it came from. They never did find a definitive answer. Some say the creature was some government experiment gone rogue. 
others blame toxic waste from some forgotten dumping ground. The old-timers whispered of ancient legends, spirits of the deep woods give in terrible form. Me? I don't know what to believe anymore. All I know is that out there, in the shadows where the wild things dwell, there are horrors beyond our understanding. They couldn't hush up the incident completely. Word leaked stories of the Pine Ridge Monster became local legend, a campfire tale whispered to frightened children. But I know the truth. The memory of that night, of the girl's tear-streaked face, will never leave me. My heroism came at a price. They gave me medals, shook my hand, and sent me back out on patrol. But they don't see the way I flinch at every rustle in the trees, the way the shadows seem to stretch out like claws when I'm on those lonely back roads. The town of Pine Ridge eventually returned to some kind of normalcy. The tourists come now, morbidly curious, but the locals still give the woods a wide berth. Me, I stayed on the force for a few more years. Saved a few lives, dealt with my share of drunks and petty thieves. It was never the same, though. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. Turned in my badge and left Pine Ridge for good. I live in a small coastal town these days. The sound of the ocean soothes something in me that the forest never could. I try to lead a normal life. Got married, started a family. But on some nights, I lie awake and hear the echoes of growls in the wind, see the gleam of yellow eyes in the darkness beyond my window. And I know, deep down, that it's never truly over. This happened to me on June 14, 2008. Back then, I was Deputy Ethan Kane with the Sheriff's Department in Masonville, Ohio. Sleepy little town nestled in the rolling hills, more famous for its annual corn festival than for crime. I figured my most significant challenge would be breaking up teenage beer parties, maybe catching old Mrs. Peterson's cat up a tree. Never thought I'd be staring down something out of a nightmare. But life takes funny turns sometimes, and that quiet summer evening turned into a night burned into my memory forever. It started with a call about a domestic dispute down by the old quarry. Domestic calls can go sideways in a heartbeat, and this one had the added bonus of being way out in the boondocks. My partner, Jim, was on vacation so I was riding solo. As I drove, the playful banter on the police radio faded, replaced by the buzzing of cicadas and the whisper of wind through the fields. I pulled up to a crumbling shack that was more rust and peeling paint than house. A battered pickup sat in the overgrown yard, and the stench of cheap booze hung heavy in the air. I knocked, my hand hovering near the gun holstered on my hip. I heard a shout and a thud, followed by a woman's muffled scream. Didn't take a genius to figure this one out. I kicked the flimsy door in. Inside, it was chaos. Overturned chairs, smashed beer bottles, and a sobbing woman huddled in the corner, blood streaming from a cut on her head. The guy, a hulking brute named Ray Palmer, was so drunk he could barely stand up. He lunged at me, roaring incoherently. I wrestled him to the ground, and we grappled on the filthy floor while the woman whimpered and tried to crawl away. Then, just when I thought I had Palmer subdued, something crashed through the window. Glass exploded inwards, and a dark shape hurtled into the room. For a split second, I thought it was a huge dog. Then it reared up, and my blood ran cold. The thing was easily seven feet tall, covered in coarse, gray fur. It had a powerful, hunched build, like a monstrous, deformed ape, and its eyes. Those eyes burned like fiery coals in the dim light. The woman was screaming now, a shrill wail of pure terror. 
Palmer had gone still, a look of drunken confusion on his face. The creature let out a roar that rattled the windows, then lunged at him. Its claws ripped through Palmer's shirt as if it were tissue paper, and blood sprayed across the floor. I didn't hesitate. I fired my gun, the sound deafening in the small space. The creature stumbled, and it turned those gleaming eyes on me. Time seemed to slow. I fumbled for backup ammo, my hands shaking. It came at me again, a blur of teeth and claws. I swore, and fired until the gun clicked empty. The creature let out another roar and took a swipe at me, its claws raking across my chest. Hot pain seared through me, and I fell back, hitting my head on the wall. My vision blurred, the room tilting crazily. Through the haze, I could see the creature dragging Ray Palmer's limp body out the shattered window. The woman had crawled under a table, whimpering like a wounded animal. I tried to get to my feet, but my legs wouldn't hold me. The world was fading to a dull roar, punctuated by the woman's cries. Then, just when I thought it was over, I heard the sirens. Backup had arrived. The sound sparked a surge of adrenaline, and I somehow forced myself up. I stumbled out the door, collapsing on the dusty ground as other deputies rushed into the shack. They found the woman cowering, her eyes wild, and Ray Palmer's bloody remains shredded and scattered across the overgrown yard. They called an ambulance, and I vaguely remember the sting of antiseptic and the blur of concerned faces as I drifted in and out of consciousness. They patched me up, asked a bunch of questions I couldn't answer. They called me a hero, said I saved that woman's life. But I didn't feel like a hero. I felt like prey that had barely escaped its predator. In the quiet of the hospital room that night, I lay awake, staring at the ceiling. The events of the night replayed in my mind on an endless loop. The creature's terrifying form, those burning eyes, the sheer brutality of its attack. I knew what I had seen, even if my rational mind struggled to accept it. Out there, in the shadows of those quiet woods, something monstrous lurked. When I was finally released from the hospital, my doctor prescribed rest and some strong painkillers but there was no rest for me. My dreams became haunted landscapes, filled with the creature's snarls and the echoes of screams. I drove the perimeter of the old quarry every night, searching the woods for some sign of the beast. I found nothing, only the lingering dread that made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. The town started calling it the Quarry Monster. There were sightings, Blurry photos in the local paper, half-eaten livestock turning up on farms. I tried to help, to track the thing down, but there was never any tangible proof. Folks started to whisper that I'd cracked after the attack. The department offered counseling, and even a temporary leave of absence. I refused. I wouldn't rest until I found that creature, until I'd put an end to its reign of terror. My hunt became an obsession. I spent every waking hour poring over old maps and local legends, anything that could give me a lead. People said I was crazy, obsessed, but I couldn't stop. I saw the fear in the eyes of the townsfolk, and I knew the creature was still out there, watching, waiting for its next victim. Late one night, huddled in the dim light of my ramshackle apartment— I stumbled upon a faded local newspaper article from the 1940s. It described a series of brutal animal killings near the quarry. The article mentioned an old hermit named Silas who lived deep in the woods, said to be touched in the head. Apparently, Silas raved about a devil beast, roaming the hills, a monstrous creature from the old stories. It was a thin lead but it was the only thing I had. The next morning, I drove out to the edge of the woods near where Silas's shack was supposed to be located. 
The forest seemed to close in around me, the air heavy and still. I followed a barely discernible deer path, my boots crunching on fallen leaves. The deeper I went, the more that sense of being watched grew stronger. Then, up ahead, I saw a clearing, and the crumbling remnants of a shack nearly swallowed by overgrown weeds. I approached cautiously, gun drawn. There was no sign of Silas, but the shack had a strange, oppressive feeling to it, like the air itself was holding its breath. Inside, I found walls covered in crude drawings, images of a hulking, monstrous ape-like creature, all claws and predatory eyes. My heart sank. Those eyes, they were the same ones I had seen that terrible night at the quarry. Suddenly, I heard a growl low and menacing. I whirled around, and there it was, silhouetted against the light filtering into the clearing. The creature was even bigger than I remembered, its fur matted and its eyes burning with malevolent intent. It snarled, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth. Fear and adrenaline surged through me. I raised my gun and fired, the shots echoing through the trees. The creature roared in pain, but it didn't fall. Enraged, it charged. I fired again, emptying my weapon, but it seemed barely slowed. Desperation clawed at my throat. I turned and ran, crashing through the undergrowth, the creature's heavy footfalls pounding behind me. I stumbled out of the trees and onto a narrow dirt road. An old pickup truck was rattling towards me. For a wild second, I thought it was a hallucination brought on by terror. I waved frantically, the driver swerved, and the truck screeched to a halt. I flung myself into the passenger seat, barely slamming the door before the creature burst from the woods. The driver an old farmer with eyes wide in terror, hit the gas. The truck lurched forward, fishtailing in the dirt as the creature lunged for us. It clawed at the truck bed, leaving deep gouges in the metal. I fumbled in my pocket for more bullets with shaking hands. The old farmer was yelling something incoherent, but I barely heard him over the pounding of my heart. Finally, we hit the paved road, jolting and bouncing, and slowly put some distance between us and the woods. I looked back. The creature stood at the edge of the tree line, its form a dark smudge against the fading light. It didn't pursue us further. For a moment, its burning eyes seemed to fix on me, and a chill ran through my bones. Then, it turned and vanished back into the shadows. We didn't stop until we reached town. I stumbled out of the truck, mumbling my thanks. The old farmer still looked shell-shocked, but he managed a shaky nod, then drove off. I stood there, my legs wobbly, the whole world tilted and unreal. I knew then that it wasn't over. That creature was still out there, lurking in the depths of the woods, waiting for its chance to strike again. After math, the news of my second encounter spread like wildfire. The local papers ran sensational headlines, fueling the paranoia that had already gripped the town. Some even accused me of staging the whole thing, of being an attention seeker. The department put me on mandatory leave. They sent a shrink who poked and prodded at my mind until I wanted to scream. I became... Crazy Deputy Kane, the one who saw monsters in the woods. But deep down, I knew the truth. And I wasn't giving up. I began training like never before, honing my marksmanship, studying local wildlife, anything that could give me an edge if I ever faced that creature again. I became a shadow haunting the edge of the woods, a vigilante in a town that didn't believe me. One moonlit night... While crouched on a ridge overlooking the quarry, I saw it again. The creature was moving through the trees below, a monstrous silhouette against the dim light. Hate and determination surged through me. This was it, my chance to end this. 
I descended the ridge, moving as stealthily as a cat. The creature had paused near the quarry pool, its hulking form reflected in the still water. I was close enough to see the ragged scars and patches of missing fur on its body, evidence of our past encounters. I raised my rifle, my hands steady, and took aim. For a brief moment, those fiery eyes locked with mine through the scope. It was as if the creature knew exactly who I was, remembered the pain I had caused it. Then I squeezed the trigger. The rifle roared, the recoil slamming into my shoulder. The creature let out a roar of pain and fury, then vanished into the darkness. I cautiously approached the spot where it had stood. There was a patch of matted dark fur and a small pool of blood. I'd wounded it, but not fatally. The knowledge brought a grim satisfaction. I left a small piece of cloth from my shirt soaked in my blood near the pool. It was a challenge and a promise. This was far from over. The creature didn't make any more appearances for a while. The killing stopped, and the town started to relax. Folks began to think the worst was over, that maybe the monster had died or moved on. I didn't share their optimism. I spent my nights patrolling the woods, following any faint trail, listening to the whispers of the wind through the trees. And the whispers started to speak of sightings again, mutilated animals, figures glimpsed at the edge of the tree line. Fear began to creep back into the town. They started calling me, asking for help, begging me to do something. I'd become their reluctant protector, the only one who believed, the only one who would fight the monster in the shadows. I guess that's my life now. I'm not a hero. I'm just a man doing what he has to, trapped in a nightmare that won't end. Sometimes I think about leaving Masonville, putting all this behind me. But then I remember the quarry, and the look in Ray Palmer's eyes as the creature dragged him away. I remember the woman cowering beneath the table, and I know I can't walk away. Not as long as the monster lurks in the woods. This happened to me on February 26, 1995. My name is Deputy Ben Harris, and I work the night shift in the small town of Willow Springs, nestled right up against the Ozark National Forest here in Arkansas. Life out here is usually quiet. Folks are friendly. The most excitement is usually breaking up a drunken brawl at the Rusty Nail. Figured I was destined for traffic stops, and lost dog reports. Shows what I knew. It all started with a missing person report. A hunter named Tom Baxter hadn't come back from his weekend trip. Tom was an experienced woodsman, the type who knew the forest better than his own backyard. Still, with winter settling in, folks got worried. A search party headed out the next day, and I figured they'd find him holed up in a cabin with a sprained ankle or similar. Instead, they found a scene straight out of a nightmare. They found Tom, or what was left of him, up in a tree near an old, overgrown logging trail. His body was, it was torn apart, like some wild animal got to him. Claws, not teeth, was the coroner's verdict. It made no sense. Bears didn't act like that, either did mountain lions. Panic stirred through Willow Springs like a kicked-up hornet's nest. The sheriff, good old Sheriff Owens, brushed it off as a freak animal attack. Bear gone rogue, maybe a cougar passing through. He told folks to be cautious, arm themselves, standard precautions. But me, something about Tom's death felt wrong. It was more than instinct— it was the look in the search party's eyes, a mix of horror and confusion that no rogue bear could explain. I started sneaking out into the woods, following my own hunch. The old-timers had stories, 
whispers of strange lights deep in the forest, of cattle turning up mutilated, of disappearances dating back years. They called it the Ridge Devil, some kind of monster from the backwoods. I never believed those tales, but with Tom's body fresh in my mind, let's just say I was starting to reconsider. One night, a few weeks later, it happened. I was patrolling a dirt road on the edge of the forest, the moon casting long shadows through the trees. My radio crackled, a report of a disturbance at the Miller farm on the far side of the county. The Millers were good folk, and if they were calling for backup, it was something serious. I hit the gas, my old cruiser bouncing and rattling as I sped down the deserted road. The Miller farmhouse came into view, a lone beacon of light against the vast darkness of the forest. As I pulled into the driveway, a chill ran down my spine. The place was deathly silent. No barking dogs, no frantic voices, just an oppressive feeling that made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. I cautiously approached the house, gun drawn. The front door was hanging open, a gaping black maw in the dim light. I crept inside, my flashlight beam cutting through the gloom. The living room was a scene of chaos, furniture overturned, curtains torn down, and smears of something dark spattered on the floor. Blood, my gut clenched. Then I heard it, a growl, low and guttural, coming from upstairs. Whatever had done this was still here. Taking a deep breath to steady my nerves, I slowly made my way up the stairs, my boots creaking on the old wood. The smell of blood grew stronger, mixed with a foul, musky odor that made my stomach churn. The master bedroom door stood ajar. I pushed it open and froze. Mrs. Miller lay on the floor, her body mangled and broken. And in the far corner of the room, crouched in the shadows, was the creature. It was immense, easily seven feet tall, even hunched over. Its skin seemed stretched tight over bone, a sickly pale gray. And its eyes, they burned like red embers in the darkness. Claws the size of carving knives tipped its long, skeletal fingers, and when it snarled, I saw rows of needle-sharp teeth. For a moment, time seemed to stutter. My rational mind screamed that this was impossible, that monsters didn't exist. But there it was, nightmare-made flesh, staring at me with predatory hunger. I snapped out of my stupor and fired my gun. The shots echoed like thunder in the small room, and the creature let out an ear-splitting shriek. It stumbled back, then lunged. I fired wildly, emptying my weapon as it crashed into me, sending us both tumbling to the floor. The sickening smell of its breath washed over me, and its claws raked across my chest, tearing through my uniform. Pain exploded through me, but pure terror fueled my next move. With a desperate surge of strength, I kicked the creature hard in the stomach, sending it reeling back. I scrambled to my feet and stumbled out of the room, slamming the door behind me. I could hear the creature snarling and pounding against the flimsy wood, but I didn't wait to find out how long it would hold. I ran downstairs, out the front door, and didn't stop until I reached the safety of my cruiser. Slamming the car into gear, I peeled out of the driveway, tires spitting gravel. In the rearview mirror, I saw the creature burst through the front door of the farmhouse, its form silhouetted against the porch light. Fear propelled me down the road, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. I roared into town, siren blaring, and screeched to a halt in front of the sheriff's station. Leaping from the cruiser, I burst inside, shouting about the creature, the attack on the Miller farm. Sheriff Owen stared at me, his face a mix of disbelief and dawning horror, as I stumbled through my incoherent ramblings. A few other deputies looked on, skepticism warring with growing unease in their eyes. 
It took some convincing, some pulling up my ripped uniform to show the bloody claw marks, but the sheriff finally relented. He called in reinforcements from neighboring towns, and soon a heavily armed posse assembled, ready to head out to the Miller farm. I felt a surge of grim satisfaction. They couldn't write me off as crazy now. But mingled with that was the bone-deep fear of what we would find out there. The scene at the farm was even worse than I remembered. The deputies, hardened men who had seen their share of rural tragedies, looked pale and shaken. The creature was gone, vanished back into the woods, but the carnage it had left behind was undeniable proof I hadn't lost my mind. Mrs. Miller's body was gone, the creature presumably having dragged it off to feed. Mr. Miller was found later, hiding up in the attic, traumatized and barely able to speak. In the cold light of dawn, they collected evidence, claw marks, blood, Mrs. Miller's torn clothes, enough to convince even the most stubborn that something monstrous had been here. I became the talk of the town, the deputy who had stared into the abyss and lived to tell the tale. But they still whispered, called me Monster Ben, a mix of morbid fascination and lingering doubt. The days turned into weeks. The creature made no further appearances, but the damage was done. A pall of fear settled over Willow Springs. Folks didn't go out after dark, tourists vanished, and the once quiet town became a shadow of its former self. Hunters and experienced trackers scoured the forest, but found nothing, no clear tracks, no signs of a lair. It was as if the creature had melted back into the earth from where it had come. The sheriff tried to play it down, hush things up, but the story leaked. News crews descended, hungry for sensational headlines. My face stared out from tabloids, hero cop battles backwards beast. They twisted the truth, made a monster of me as much as they did of the creature. I couldn't take it any more. The nightmares, the constant glances over my shoulder— the feeling of being trapped in my own personal horror movie turned my life into a waking hell. One morning, I packed my meager belongings, wrote a resignation letter to the sheriff, and got in my old cruiser. I took one last look at the dark edge of the forest, a silent challenge hanging in the air, and drove away from Willow Springs, never looking back. After math, it would be nice to tell you I found a quiet town, settled down, and made a new life free of the past. But the truth is, you can't outrun your demons. I drift from place to place, never staying long. Small towns, backwoods bars, anywhere I can blend into the background. I check the local news, scan the police blotters, half hoping, half dreading that the reports of mutilated cattle and strange sightings will start trickling in. Some nights I lie awake and see those burning red eyes, feel the rake of its claws, smell its foul breath. I've started drinking more, the only way to dull the constant hum of dread that thrums beneath my skin. Sometimes I think I see it lurking in the shadows, just at the edge of my sight, and I know the paranoia is gnawing away at what's left of my sanity. Maybe this how those old-timers in Willow Springs felt— the ones who told the Ridge Devil stories, driven half-mad by the things they couldn't explain. I joined the army for a while, figuring I was used to fighting impossible odds. But the structure, the blind obedience, it wasn't for me. I craved the solitude of the open road, the endless miles stretching towards an unknown horizon. Maybe it's a fool's hope that I can keep ahead of the monster— or that one day I'll find a place where the shadows don't seem to writhe and twist with unseen menace. Maybe some would call me a coward for running. But after staring into the abyss, I learned a hard truth. Not all battles can be won. Some you just have to survive. And maybe, deep down, some twisted part of me wants revenge. Maybe that's why I keep driving, 
keep scanning the desolate landscapes. Because out there, somewhere in the vast wilderness of America, the creature is still lurking. One day our paths will cross again. And on that day, it won't be me who's running. This happened to me on October 12, 2001. Just a month after September 11, when the whole world felt like it was teetering on the edge of chaos. I was a rookie cop then, Officer Will Denton, working the beat in the quiet mountain town of Pine Falls, Colorado. Thought the most action I'd see would be a domestic dispute or chasing down stray cows that got loose from the Henderson farm. Life has a funny way of proving you wrong. It started with a routine call, a report of a disturbance up at Old Man Cooper's cabin. Cooper was the town's certified hermit, lived in a crumbling shack deep in the woods, the kind of guy who yelled at kids to get off his lawn and muttered conspiracy theories at the general store. Most folks just left him be, but I figured, hey, duty calls. I drove the cruiser up the winding dirt road that snaked into the thick pine forest. The further I went, the heavier the sense of unease settled over me. Late fall was creeping in, a chill in the air, the trees skeletal and bare. When I reached the cabin, it looked deserted. No lights, no sound but the wind whistling through the broken eaves. Still, that prickle of apprehension down my spine wouldn't fade. I cautiously approached the cabin, gun drawn. The door creaked open, held by a rusty chain. Mr. Cooper? I called out, my voice echoing in the silence. No answer. I stepped inside. The cabin reeked of something rotten and sour, a scent that made my stomach churn. The place was turned upside down, furniture smashed, books strewn everywhere like a tornado had ripped through. Splatters of something dark stained the walls. Blood, a sick realization hit me. My heart started pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. Then I heard it, a rustling sound from the back room. I moved towards it, every nerve in my body screaming at me to run. The room was shrouded in shadow, the only light filtering through a grimy window. And that's when I saw it. My mind initially refused to process the sight. It couldn't be real. The creature was massive, easily eight feet tall. It stood on two legs, but its body was hunched and distorted, all sinewy muscle covered in coarse, gray fur. Its head was wolf-like, with a long, jagged-toothed muzzle, but its eyes, they were a burning, hateful yellow. For a split second, we both just froze. I couldn't comprehend what I was seeing, and something like surprise flickered across the creature's grotesque face. Then the surprise shifted to rage, and it let out a roar that shook the cabin walls. Its claws, like knives made of bone, sliced through the air as it lunged. I snapped out of my stupor and fired my gun. The shots boomed in the enclosed space deafening. The creature stumbled back, a spray of dark blood splattering the wall, but it wasn't enough. It charged again, a blur of teeth and claws. I barely had time to duck before it crashed into the wall where I had been standing, sending splinters of wood flying. Desperation fueled my next move. I lunged for the doorway, scrambling out of the cabin. The creature was right behind me, its hot, fetid breath on my neck. I could almost feel its claws tearing into me. I burst out into the weak daylight, slamming the cabin door shut. I heard the splintering of wood as the creature rammed against the door, again and again. It wouldn't hold for long. Terror propelled me forward. I ran, crashing through the underbrush, branches whipping at my face. My lungs burned, but I didn't dare stop. The creature's furious roars echoed behind me, 
each one getting closer. Just when I thought my legs would give out, I saw a dirt track cutting through the trees. There was a chance this led back to the main road. Filled with renewed desperation, I sprinted for the track, nearly tripping and sprawling in my haste. Behind me, the cabin door gave way with a splintering crash. The creature was free. I pounded down the track, my breath coming in ragged gasps. The creature's roars were right behind me. I ran until my lungs screamed and my vision blurred at the edges. Then up ahead I saw the glint of metal, a parked truck. With a final burst of speed, I stumbled towards it, praying someone was inside. The truck was unlocked. I flung myself into the driver's seat, fumbling for the keys. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the creature break through the trees. My hands finally closed around the keys, and I twisted them in the ignition. The truck's engine sputtered to life. The creature let out a deafening bellow of rage and lunged for the truck. I slammed the truck into gear and stomped on the gas. Tires spun, kicking up dirt, and the truck lurched forward. The creature slammed into the side of the vehicle, its claws screeching against the metal. I swerved wildly, trying to dislodge it, and the truck fishtailed down the track. With a final screech of metal, the creature was thrown off. I didn't look back. I barreled down the track, branches lashing against the truck, my heart threatening to burst out of my chest. In the rearview mirror, I caught a glimpse of the creature standing at the edge of the trees, its hulking form silhouetted against the deepening twilight. Its burning eyes bore into me, a promise of vengeance that chilled me to the bone. Finally, the track merged onto the main road. I pressed the accelerator harder, the truck rattling and shaking as I pushed it to its limits. Up ahead, I saw the lights of Pine Falls, a beacon of hope in the gathering darkness. But even as relief washed over me, the knowledge remained that creature was still out there, lurking in the shadows. The town was in chaos when I arrived. I could see the fear in the faces of the townsfolk, hear it in the tremble in their voices as I stumbled through a garbled explanation of what I had seen. The sheriff, old man Burke, who had always regarded me with a mix of skepticism and amusement, stared at me with undisguised horror. A search party was hastily assembled. Armed with rifles and spotlights, they headed up the mountain towards Cooper's cabin. I went with them, a strange mixture of dread and determination twisting my guts. We found what was left of the cabin, a shattered ruin. There was blood, torn scraps of Cooper's clothing, and the creature's tracks disappearing into the dense forest. Of Cooper himself, there was no sign. We spent the rest of the night combing the woods, but the creature was gone, vanished like a specter. The hunters, seasoned woodsmen who had tracked bears and mountain lions, were unnerved. They couldn't explain the tracks, the sheer size and savagery of the attack. They whispered among themselves, their flashlights painting jittery arcs in the darkness. The days and weeks that followed were a nightmare. Pine Falls descended into a state of perpetual siege. People locked themselves indoors after sunset the once peaceful streets deserted. Search parties found nothing but a few mutilated deer carcasses. Then the disappearances started. A hiker vanished from a popular trail. A lone camper's tent was found ripped to shreds, soaked in blood. The paranoia reached fever pitch. Folks blamed me, said I'd stirred up something evil, some curse unleashed upon the town. I spent every waking moment patrolling the woods, following every faint trail, every rumor. I became obsessed, the creature's face seared into my memory, the sound of its roars haunting my dreams. My marriage fell apart. Sarah couldn't bear the constant fear, the unspoken knowledge that I might not come home one night. 
I barely saw my young son, afraid to expose him to the darkness that had consumed me. The job, the life I knew, crumbled away. Then came the night that changed everything. I was driving a back road near the old quarry, the moon painting the landscape in shades of silver and black. That's when I saw the creature again, crossing the road ahead, a monstrous silhouette bathed in moonlight. It moved with unnatural speed, vanishing into the trees before I could even react. I slammed on the brakes, the cruiser skidding to a halt. This time, I wouldn't run. I grabbed my rifle from the back seat and plunged into the woods, following the faint rustles and cracking branches that marked its path. The forest seemed to close in around me, the shadows alive with unseen threats. My breath rasped in my throat, each heartbeat a deafening drumbeat in my ears. Finally, I stumbled into a clearing, the quarry pool gleaming dully in the moonlight. And there it was. The creature crouched at the water's edge, its form monstrous and distorted in the reflection. It was lapping at the water, and even from a distance, I could see dark stains coating its muzzle. Blood. Rage and a bitter grief twisted through me. So many deaths, so much terror, laid at this creature's feet. I raised my rifle, my hands steady. It didn't sense me at first, focused on its gruesome meal. This was my chance. I took a deep breath, lined up the sights, and squeezed the trigger. The gunshot cracked through the stillness, echoing through the quarry. The creature jerked a startled snarl ripping from its throat. I fired again and again until the rifle clicked empty. The creature roared in pain and thrashed about, its massive form churning the water. Then it stumbled back into the trees, disappearing into the darkness with surprising speed for its injured state. Moonlight glinted off wet blood on the ground where it had stood. I'd wounded it, but not fatally. Aftermath the creature didn't make any more blatant attacks after that night. But it didn't simply vanish either. Hunters caught glimpses of it deep in the woods. Livestock turned up mauled, campers reporting unsettling noises outside their tents at night. The fear in Pine Falls didn't dissipate, it merely shifted, became a low-level hum of unease that thrummed beneath the surface of our daily lives. I didn't leave Pine Falls. Couldn't. Something kept me tethered to that place, a grim sense of responsibility mixed with a simmering desire for vengeance. I became a ghost haunting the woods, a solitary figure patrolling the back roads in my battered cruiser. The townsfolk got used to seeing me, a grim reminder of the lurking threat. Some called me a hero, others a man-man. I didn't care. The years slipped by, my hair streaked with gray, the lines on my face etched deeper. My son grew up, got married, moved to the city. I saw him on holidays, a polite distance between us. He didn't understand my obsession, couldn't comprehend the darkness that clung to me. Sometimes, I didn't understand it myself. And the creature? It became a part of the local lore. A dark legend whispered around campfires and in hushed tones at the local tavern. A boogeyman to scare children and a mystery that drew in the occasional foolhardy monster hunter. There were rumored sightings, blurry photos, but nothing as undeniable as that first horrifying encounter. Maybe it was dying, or had moved on. Or maybe it was simply content to watch from the shadows, toying with us. Life in Pine Falls regained some semblance of normalcy. Tourists trickled back in, drawn by the quaint charm and the promise of unspoiled wilderness. But those of us who lived through those terror-filled months, we never truly forgot. We still checked the tree line a little too closely, still jump at sudden noises in the night. Because we know that out there, in the vast expanse of the Colorado Rockies, Something monstrous still lurks. And one day, 
it might return to finish what it started. This happened to me on February 18, 1999. I was working as a deputy with the county sheriff's department in the little town of Havenwood nestled deep in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri. Life around here is peaceful. Most of my calls involve chasing stray chickens or settling feuds over property lines. Thought the biggest threat I'd face was boredom. But as always, life had a way of proving me wrong. It started with the Wallace family. The Wallaces were newcomers, city folk who bought up the old, abandoned Henderson farm on the outskirts of town. They kept to themselves mostly, but there were whispers, rumors they were into some kind of weird cult, that they were performing strange rituals out in the woods. Folks around here are God-fearing and suspicious of outsiders. Probably just harmless eccentrics, I figured. Then their son, Elijah, went running into town one night, terrified out of his mind. He was babbling something about monsters in the woods, about his parents being taken. The sheriff calmed him down, dismissed it as a nightmare, kids' overactive imagination or something. I wasn't so sure. There was something off about the look in that boy's eyes, a kind of primal terror that was hard to dismiss. The next morning, Sheriff Thompson sent me out to do a welfare check on the Wallace family. I drove out to their farm, the old logging road winding through thick forest. The place looked deserted, overgrown and neglected. I approached the farmhouse cautiously, something about the silence pricking at my nerves. That's when I saw the blood. It was smeared on the front porch, dark streaks leading into the house. The front door stood ajar, creaking slightly in the breeze. I called out, my voice echoing eerily into the empty house. No reply. Dread settling in the pit of my stomach, I drew my gun and pushed the door open. The sight that met my eyes was one I will carry with me to my grave. The living room was a scene of utter devastation. Furniture was overturned and smashed the walls spattered with blood. In the center of the room lay the bodies of Mr. and Mrs. Wallace, or more accurately, what was left of them. Their corpses were torn and mutilated, the wounds ragged and unnatural. It looked like an animal attack, but deeper, more savage than anything I had ever witnessed. This was no mountain lion or rabid dog. Panic and nausea rose in my throat. I stumbled back outside, gasping for fresh air as I stumbled for my radio. My call to the sheriff was frantic, urgent. Backup arrived quickly, sirens shattering the rural tranquility. We searched the farm, scouring the surrounding woods. Found nothing but a few strange, oversized tracks in the soft earth near the tree lean and an oppressive sense of wrongness hanging in the air. The investigation that followed was a nightmare. The coroner couldn't determine the cause of death, the wounds unlike anything she'd seen. State wildlife experts were called in, but they were baffled too. Elijah Wallace vanished, the only witness gone. The townsfolk got spooked, their distrust of the Wallaces turning into outright fear. Whispers about dark forces, old curses, things lurking unseen in the woods filled the local tavern. Sheriff Thompson dismissed it all as nonsense, an animal attack or maybe some kind of occult ritual gone wrong. But I saw the carnage in that farmhouse, saw the look in those dead eyes. And deep down, a cold certainty grew in me that there was something monstrous out there in the vast expanse of the Ozarks. One moonlit night, about a month later, I was on patrol when I saw it. My cruiser's headlights cut through the thick fog, and for a heart-stopping moment, it was illuminated in the beams. A hulking form, hunched and distorted, standing on the edge of the road. It had the body of an ape, 
covered in thick, dark fur, but its head was elongated, lupin, crowned with a set of wicked horns. Its eyes, reflecting the headlights, burned with a chilling yellow light. For an instant, time seemed to freeze. Then, it lunged into the undergrowth, disappearing into the darkness with unnerving speed. I slammed on the brakes, the cruiser fishtailing to a stop. My heart pounded in my chest, and a cold sweat broke out on my brow. Hands shaking, I fumbled for my radio, my voice ragged as I reported the sighting to a disbelieving Sheriff Thompson. He wrote it off as stress, exhaustion, told me to go home, get some rest. But I couldn't rest. I knew what I saw. That night, I started my own investigation, poring over old maps, local legends, anything that might offer a clue about the creature lurking in the woods. I became obsessed, driven by a mix of fear and determination. I couldn't let whatever was out there continue to terrorize the town. I was no longer just a deputy doing his job. This had become personal. One recurring name kept surfacing in the old stories, the Ozark Howler, a creature of local folklore said to haunt these hills. The descriptions varied, but they all shared common threads, a monstrous, horned beast, savage and bloodthirsty. Some legends even told of the Howler's ability to mimic human cries, drawing its prey into the shadows. Could this be what killed the Wallaces? What I saw on that foggy back road. Weeks turned into months. I spent my nights patrolling the woods, following any faint trail or rumor. My marriage crumbled. My friends thought I was going crazy. The whole town started to view me as the local loon, the deputy who saw monsters. I couldn't blame them. I started to doubt my own sanity sometimes. But that primal fear... The memory of that monstrous form fueled me. I couldn't give up, even if it meant sacrificing everything. This happened to me on October 23, 2008. My name is Dale Parsons, and I'm a deputy sheriff in Silverton, Colorado. Nestled deep in the heart of the San Juan Mountains, Silverton is the kind of place where a man can breathe deep and find a bit of peace. Been a deputy out here for nearly twelve years. Always figured I'd retire from the force right here in these mountains. That was before it happened. Sometimes, the work out here can get a bit monotonous. Usually involves settling domestic disputes, the occasional bar fight or wrangling up lost hikers. I like being here for folks, and it feels good to know I make a difference. The night it began, I was out on routine patrol in my cruiser, cruising on the deserted mountain road. It was a crisp autumn night, and the moonlight illuminated the peaks. I was about to head back when my radio crackled, breaking the silence. Unit 614, this is Dispatch. Respond to reports of suspicious activity and possible animal attack near abandoned Silver Creek Mine. Over. The Silver Creek Mine was shut down decades ago after a rock slide tragically killed a group of miners. Locals swear the place is cursed. There were always strange tales of things seen in those hills, eerie lights in the dead of night. I'd always dismissed it as the stuff of campfire stories. My duty called, superstitious nonsense or not. I flipped on my sirens, speeding towards the mine entrance. As I got closer, an unsettling chill ran down my spine. Something felt off. The air felt heavy, charged with a strange tension. I reached the abandoned mine entrance, bathed in the harsh glow of my cruiser's headlights. Something large had torn down the faded warning signs. Deep, gouge-like marks scarred the ground, unlike anything I'd ever seen. I grabbed my rifle, clicked off the safety, 
and cautiously stepped into the darkness of the mine. My flashlight beam cut through the musty air. I could smell old iron and the faint, sickly sweet scent of something I couldn't place. I crept further in, the sound of my footsteps echoing eerily. Hello? Anyone there? I called out, my voice hoarse. No response, just the dull drip of water echoing off the walls. That's when I saw it. A pile of gnawed bones, some animal, and something else. Whatever had been hunted here wasn't hunted by any mountain lion or bear. Fear not at me, but I kept moving, my rifle at the ready. A low snarl sent a spike of terror through me. I wheeled around, my flashlight sweeping across the cavern. For a heart-stopping second, nothing. Then, in the edge of the beam, a pair of eyes gleamed, blazing yellow, filled with a chilling hunger. The thing stepped into the light, and I'll never forget what I saw. It was massive, easily seven feet tall and powerfully built. Matted fur, caked in dirt and blood, covered its hunched frame. Its face, well, I can't even call it a face. It was long, wolfish, twisted into a grotesque parody of a muzzle, filled with rows of razor-sharp teeth. The eyes, filled with a chilling inhuman intelligence, fixed on me. Time seemed to slow down. My mind reeled. Was this a bear? Some mutated monstrosity? I'd never seen anything like it. It let out a blood-curdling howl that echoed through the mine, the sound cutting into my very soul. Adrenaline kicked in as the creature charged, and pure instinct took over. I pulled the trigger, unleashing a fusillade of shots. The bullet slammed into it, seeming to inflict only minor wounds that just made the thing angrier. My rifle clicked empty, and blind panic washed over me. I fumbled for another magazine as the beast bounded closer. In a desperate move, I threw the empty rifle at the creature, gaining just a few precious seconds as it snarled and ripped the metal apart. I bolted, scrambling deeper into the mine. Rocks tumbled from the ceiling as it gave chase, its claws digging into the stone floor, the sound of its snarls reverberating in the tunnels. I didn't dare look back. Blind terror had me in its grip, pushing me on. Through some stroke of luck, I found an old ventilation shaft, barely big enough for me to fit through. Risking it all, I squeezed in just as the monstrous creature appeared, snapping its jaws at empty air. Unable to reach me, it raged outside, scratching and clawing at the shaft entrance. I huddled in the darkness, shaking, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I couldn't believe what was happening. Was it still out there? Had I truly escaped? My heart hammered in my chest as the only sound was the relentless scratching of the creature's claws, trying to find a way in. Hours seemed to drag on, fear twisting my stomach into knots. It seemed like it would only be a matter of time until the creature found another way into the shaft but I held on to a sliver of hope. Maybe if I stayed put long enough, help would arrive. Maybe. Exhaustion battled the mounting terror. I had to stay awake. I started talking to myself, muttering inane things about my wife, about fishing trips, about anything to keep my mind from falling apart in the crushing darkness. At some point... I must have drifted off because I jolted awake to a sound that made my blood run cold. Silence. Had the creature given up? Or was it lying in wait? Fear pushed me to my feet. I had to get out. I couldn't stay trapped forever. Taking a shaky breath, I started crawling forward, my flashlight beam cutting through the inky blackness. The tunnel seemed to stretch on forever and my hope dwindled with every inch gained. Suddenly, a faint light appeared ahead. I scrambled towards it, my heart pounding. It was a break in the tunnel. 
I squeezed through and gasped. I was outside. I blinked, disoriented by the sudden daylight, then stumbled back in horror. A sheer cliff stretched before me. The ventilation shaft had opened onto a ledge hundreds of feet in the air. Trapped. There was nowhere to go but down, and that fall would surely be my end. Despair washed over me, a numbing sensation far worse than the terror. A sudden crash echoed from the mine. The creature was coming. Stealing myself, I turned to face my fate, but there was no sign of the beast. Only silence followed. Had I somehow lost it in the twists and turns of the tunnel? Had I gotten lucky? Before I could dwell on that, a flicker of movement below caught my eye. A rescue team, alerted by the disturbance at the mine, was sweeping the cliffs with searchlights. Hey! I'm up here! I yelled, waving my flashlight frantically. The beam of light swung and illuminated my perch. I heard shouts, the whirring of a helicopter approaching. They got me out. It took some fancy maneuvering, but those brave men pulled me off that mountainside ledge. Back at the base, I tried to describe the creature. They looked at me like I was crazy. Stress, they said. Trauma. The official reports attributed it all to a bear attack. A nasty one, sure, but nothing they hadn't seen before. Maybe they were right. Maybe the fear and isolation had twisted my perception. But deep down, I know what I saw. The image of those burning yellow eyes haunts me, a constant reminder that there are shadows far darker than the night. The folks in Silverton think I'm a hero. My picture was in the papers, got a commendation from the mayor, all the nine yards. Truth is, I don't feel like a hero. I feel changed. Things didn't go back to normal. Not for me. I see the world differently now. I see the cracks in the veneer of normalcy, the monstrous things that might lurk just below the surface. My wife, bless her heart, tried her best. She couldn't understand why I kept my gun within arm's reach even in our living room. Why I jumped at every creek in the night haunted by the image of claws ripping at stone, by that blood-curdling howl. After a year, it all fell apart. She left, saying she couldn't live with a ghost. Hard to blame her. She deserved someone who could look at the world without seeing monsters. I couldn't stay in Silverton after that. Too many memories, too many whispered rumors about the crazy deputy. Packed up my things and just drifted, one small town to the next, working odd jobs, keeping to myself. Always on guard. Always looking over my shoulder. Some nights I lie awake, staring at the ceiling, imagining those burning eyes staring back. Sometimes I swear I can still hear that unearthly howl echoing through the darkness. Maybe I am going crazy. Maybe I was crazy from the beginning. Maybe the real monster wasn't some creature in the mountain mine, but the darkness that lingers inside us all. But what if, what if I wasn't wrong? What if that thing is still out there, lurking, hungry? And what if, someday, it finds me again? This happened to me on June 6, 1999. My name's Jeff Coleman, and I've been a deputy in the small town of Willow Grove, Mississippi for, well, longer than I care to remember. Things are usually slow around here. Folks are friendly, always happy to wave or share some sweet tea. I've got a wife, Sarah, and two boys, the kind of life a man could only ever wish for. I never thought I'd see anything here that couldn't be explained away by a few restless teenagers or a moonshine bender gone wrong. Turns out, ignorance is bliss. 
It was just a regular Tuesday night patrol. I was passing by the old Jackson farm on my route. That place has always had a reputation for being haunted. Folks claim they've seen lights flickering in the windows or heard whispers echoing through the empty rooms. Of course, I always laugh that off, just old ghost stories spun for the grandkids. Something felt off that night. It was the quiet, not the normal kind. This was heavier, like the air itself was holding its breath. That's when I saw it, a dark shape slipping across the overgrown fields. My first thought was maybe some teenagers up to no good, but this thing moved, wrong. I flipped on my spotlight, and the beam swept across the field, catching the creature square on. It was like nothing I'd ever seen. It stood tall, easy on seven feet, and covered in thick, dark fur. Its face was vaguely dog-like, but twisted into a horrifying grimace, full of teeth as long as kitchen knives. But the eyes, those eyes glowed with a yellow, malevolent light that chilled me to the bone. For a few terrifying seconds, it stared right back at me, the eyes burning into my soul. I slammed on the gas and radioed for backup, but who the hell was I gonna call? What could I even say? Panic threatened to overtake me. I had to do something. My cruiser tore through the field, gaining on the creature in the headlights. I grabbed my rifle and let loose a barrage of shots, but it didn't even flinch. The Jackson farmhouse loomed ahead. As a last resort, I pulled up just as the creature reached the porch. I leapt from my car, slamming the door behind me. The porch was deserted, bathed in the harsh glow of the headlights. Come on out, you son of a... I never finished my taunt. The porch boards exploded under my feet, and a clawed hand as big as a dinner plate tore through the wood. I scrambled backward, losing my footing. The creature erupted from the hole, its roar splitting the night. Scrambling for purchase, I looked up and saw my doom barreling towards me. And then, there was gunfire. Not from me, but from the direction of the tree line. More shots rang out, sending the creature staggering backward as it howled in rage and, I swear, confusion. A figure emerged from the darkness carrying some fancy-looking rifle, too far to make out in the gloom. The mysterious stranger continued to fire, and I took the opportunity to scramble back to my wrecked cruiser, fumbling with the radio. This is Deputy Coleman. Unknown creature attacking. Shots fired at the Jackson farm need. The figure was moving forward now, gun raised, closing the distance toward that thing. My backup was still minutes away. This was going to be over before they got here. Suddenly, I heard Sarah's voice crackle over the radio. Never been happier to hear my wife nagging me about dinner in my life. Jeff? What's going on out there? You sound... She never got a chance to finish. A blood-curdling screech, inhuman in its intensity, filled the air. The radio went dead. I pounded on the dash, voice hoarse. Sarah? Sarah, answer me. No response just an endless crackle of static. Blind terror slammed into me. That thing was going for my house, for Sarah, for my boys. With a roar of fury, I slammed the cruiser into gear and tore down the dirt road back towards town. The drive felt like an eternity, each second twisting the knife of dread deeper. Finally, our modest house came into view. Everything looked intact from a distance, but I knew better than to trust my eyes. I parked across the street, gun out, heart thundering. I crept toward the house, my ears straining for the slightest sound. Nothing. Eerily, the front door stood slightly ajar. I eased the door open, the smell of copper hitting me like a wave. 
No sign of Sarah or the boys, but there was a trail of blood leading deeper into the house. My throat closed up. I followed it, my every step echoing in the silent house. The trail led to our bedroom. My breath hitched in my throat. The door was splintered inward, the wood scattered across the floor, covered in more blood, and deep claw marks gouged into the wood. I pushed the door open, rifle raised, ready for anything, and found nothing. The room was empty. A wave of despair hit me with a force that nearly sent me to my knees. They were gone. That creature took my family. No, I choked out, my voice raw with grief. No way, but that's when I heard it. A faint whimper, coming from under the bed. My heart leapt with a flicker of desperate hope. I dropped to my knees, aiming my flashlight into the darkness. There they were. My boys huddled together, their eyes wide with terror. I scrambled under the bed, pulling them into my arms. Their tears fell hot on my face as I held them tight, whispering apologies for not being there to protect them. Sarah was nowhere to be seen. My heart sank, but I had to keep it together. The boys needed me. We had to get out of there, find help, anywhere that was safe. I lifted myself up, still cradling my children close. That's when I saw it. Sarah's phone, lying cracked and forgotten under the edge of the nightstand. She must have dropped it when the thing attacked. A sliver of hope. If she was still alive, she might have tried to call for help. I reached for the phone, my trembling fingers tapping the screen. The battery was nearly dead, but the call history showed one outgoing call, the sheriff's department. I jammed the phone to my ear, praying. Hello? Sheriff's department, this is dispatch. How can I help you? It was Carol, the dispatcher. Good. Carol was tough, unflappable. I took a deep, steadying breath then poured out my story, the creature at the farmhouse, the attack on my home, my missing wife. I'm sure I sounded unhinged, but Carol's voice remained crisp and professional. Deputy Coleman, stay where you are. We have units on the way, including animal control. Sit. I didn't need instructions. I had my orders. Carol, my voice cracked with desperation. Listen, whatever that thing is, animal control isn't gonna cut it. Deputy Coleman, it might be a bear dash. It's not a bear, Carol. You need to send everyone you've got, and for the love of God, tell them to come armed. There was a silence on the line, then Carol's voice, a touch hesitant. Deputy Coleman, I understand you're upset, but we need to stick to protocol. Damn your protocol! I exploded, guilt twisting through me. Should I stay here with my terrified sons? But if I waited for backup, that creature could be anywhere, hunting Sarah. I made my choice. Get those units out there now, I said, my voice tight with command. I'm going after it. Before Carol could respond, I ended the call, pocketed the phone, and gently set my boys back down. They looked up at me, eyes filled with fear and a glimmer of trust. Stay here, lock the door, don't open for anyone but the police, understand? I choked out. My oldest nodded, clutching his brother close. I wanted to stay, to protect them, but Sarah needed me more. Kissing each boy on the head, I turned and bolted for my cruiser. It was time to hunt. The drive back to the old Jackson place felt impossibly long, each mile fueled by rage and fear. The road was crawling with police vehicles, headlights flashing, sirens wailing. I skidded to a stop, nearly crashing into an animal control van. Chaos. Dozens of officers and animal control personnel milled around the dark farmhouse, 
illuminated only by the harsh glow of headlights and flashlights. Their faces were a blur of confusion and barely concealed fear. One face stood out, though, the stranger with the rifle. He was talking to a group of officers, his back to me. He was tall, his shoulders broad under a weathered hunting jacket. I pushed through the crowd, my legs pumping on pure adrenaline. As I approached, he turned, and my breath hitched in my throat. He was young. Couldn't have been more than twenty. I shoved that shock down. Age didn't matter. He saved my life. You! I barked, my voice rough. You the one who was shooting at that thing? The kid looked at me, his eyes narrowed. Then he simply nodded, a flicker of recognition crossing his face. I stuck out my hand. Deputy Coleman! He hesitated, then took it. His grip was firm. Name's Luke. Jeff. Look, we don't have time for niceties. It took my wife. I need your help to track it down. Luke's eyes widened in surprise. Then, a grim line tightened his jaw. He nodded slowly. All right, deputy. Let's get hunting. The hunt led us into the woods behind the farmhouse. The beams of flashlights danced and weaved, cutting through the darkness. Luke moved with practiced silence, every sense honed on the task at hand. I tried to keep up, my mind racing ahead, conjuring up horrific images of what might have happened to Sarah. We followed a trail easy enough to spot, broken branches, blood splatters, gouges torn into the bark by giant claws. This thing was powerful, but sloppy. It was leaving a path right to its doorstep. I found myself trusting Luke. His calm focus was infectious. We moved together in a wordless rhythm, covering ground quickly. The deeper into the woods we went, the tenser I wound. Every rustle, every snap of a branch set my teeth on edge. Luke froze suddenly, holding up a fist. I went still, then saw it. A dark shape lay sprawled on the ground ahead. You think, I choked out, hope battling with dread. Luke shook his head, then signaled for me to follow. We approached cautiously, rifles ready. As we got closer, my worst fears were confirmed. It wasn't Sarah. It was a deer, savaged and torn to shreds. My stomach turned. If the creature could do this to a deer, what had it done to my wife? A wave of sick despair washed over me. I wanted to turn away, but Luke forged ahead, examining the carcass with clinical precision. Tracks, he grunted. Fresh. It's close. I nodded grimly, pushing down another wave of nausea. We resumed our pursuit, the creature's trail of death leading us further into the heart of the woods. Finally, the stench hit me, a sickly metallic odor of blood and something else I didn't want to define. My flashlight beam cut through the tangle of trees, and I saw it, a cave mouth, its dark entrance gaping wide. Even from a distance, I could make out the splatter of fresh blood across the rough stone. This was it. Its lair. I swallowed hard, fear clawing at my insides. Sarah could be in there, alive or... I wouldn't let myself finish that thought. Luke met my gaze, his young face set in grim determination. We can't go in blind. He reached into his pack and pulled out something that looked like a military walkie-talkie, but with way more dials and switches. Thermal camera. Let's us pick up heat signatures. He pressed a few buttons then lifted the device to scan the cave entrance. There. See that? He pointed towards a readout on the device. A large, amorphous blob glowed brightly on the screen, pulsating irregularly. My heart pounded in my chest. That was it, the creature, lurking in its den. 
I turned to Luke, my words laced with desperation. She could be in there, alive. We need a plan. Luke nodded, already deep in thought. It's big, too strong for a head-on fight. We need to draw it out, catch it in the open. He laid out the plan, a simple yet calculated scheme. I'd circle around and position myself across from the cave mouth, armed and ready. Luke would go in, make some noise, flush the creature out. Hopefully it would charge, and we could hit it from two sides. It was risky, reckless even, but it was the only chance we had. Leaving Sarah to die in that beast's den wasn't an option. As we split up, I felt a surge of gratitude for this strange kid who'd materialized out of the darkness, armed with a fancy rifle and a willingness to risk his own hide right alongside me. I crept through the undergrowth, my boots barely making a sound on the forest floor. The cave loomed ahead, its stench intensifying with each step. I took my position, settling low to the ground, rifle trembling in my sweaty hands. My pulse roared in my ears, drowning out the night sounds until there was only my ragged breathing and the thudding of my own heart. Then there it was, a low growl rising from the cave, echoing through the trees. Luke was doing his part. My knuckles ached from how hard I was gripping my rifle. And then it burst from the cave, a blur of matted fur and glistening fangs. The creature was charging straight for me. I fired, the rifle bucking hard against my shoulder. The shots made it flinch, but it kept coming. I fired again and again, the smell of cordite filling my nostrils. My ears rang, every instinct screaming at me to run, but I held my ground. This was it, my chance to end this monster, to save Sarah. Suddenly, another shot rang out from my left. The creature staggered, a howl of rage ripping from its throat. Luke was in position, firing relentlessly. It turned its massive head towards him, momentarily confused, giving me the opening I needed. I took a breath, calmed my aim, and fired a final shot. It hit the creature square in the chest. Blood sprayed, and its roar cut off in a choking gurgle. It stumbled then crashed to the ground with a final groan that shook the trees around us. For a dizzying moment, there was only silence and the pounding of my own heart. Slowly, cautiously, Luke and I approached the creature. It was immense, even in death. Its eyes had glazed over, the malevolent spark finally extinguished. My legs nearly gave out in relief. Then, a noise from the cave a ragged sob. Sarah! I was a blur of motion, scrambling towards the dark cave entrance. Luke right behind me. We stumbled into the cave, our flashlights desperately cutting through the gloom. There, huddled in a far corner, was Sarah battered and bloody but alive. I rushed to her, scooping her into my arms. Relief washed over me in hot waves, then shame. Shame that I'd ever doubted she was strong enough to survive. In the chaos that followed, everything blurs together. The paramedics tending to Sarah, Luke quietly slipping back into the darkness before anyone could question him, animal control wrestling with the monstrous corpse outside. There were explanations, endless questions, but I blocked most of it out focused only on Sarah and the miracle of finding her alive. The aftermath, as they liked to call it, wasn't easy. Willow Grove was never the same quiet little town again. Sightings of strange creatures continued, whispered stories passed down by wide-eyed children. The official report? Rabid bear attack, of course. Easier for folks to swallow. Sarah recovered physically but some wounds run deeper. I'd like to say knowing what was really out there changed me, made me braver. Truth is, sometimes I lie awake at night and listen to the creak of the floorboards, 
remembering the moment those blood-soaked claws ripped through them, remembering the creature that almost ripped my family apart. As for Luke, well, I never saw him again. Sometimes, I hike out to the cave, just to be sure it's still empty. People think I'm crazy, but they don't know. They don't know that a stranger with a rifle and a steady hand saved our lives that night and then vanished back into the darkness. A part of me hopes he's okay out there, whatever he is, wherever he ends up. A part of me knows he's more than okay. He's a hunter in the shadows, out there keeping people like me safe from the things that go bump in the night. This happened to me on June 16, 2001. It's hard to believe it's been that long. Time flies. Back then, I was still a rookie cop in Red Bluff, California. A small, quiet town, the sort of place where nothing out of the ordinary happens, or so I thought. I was raised on a ranch outside of town. I knew everyone there and they knew me. After high school and a stint in the Marines, it felt natural to come back home and try to make a difference in my community. Most days were routine, traffic violations, the occasional drunken brawl at the town bar. Nothing I couldn't manage. My partner was Will Tarkin, grizzled, with a mustache he refused to shave and a fondness for country music that grated on my nerves. We were on the night shift that Tuesday, barely a cloud in the vast California sky. I remember that because when what happened, well, you remember little details like that. It began with a missing person call. Lucille Haskins, 81 years old. Will rolled his eyes as we headed over. Probably wandered off and some neighbor find her taking a nap in a cornfield by morning. He was likely right or so I thought. Mrs. Haskins' son, Ronald, was a nervous man, balding and pudgy. His eyes darted everywhere as we took down the report. She does wander like that, but normally, not this late. Plus, look! He thrust photos at us. Her backyard, once a manicured garden, was now a scene of chaos. Fences trampled, plants uprooted, and deep furrows clawed in the soil. Like, like an animal got in. Will chuckled, scribbling in his notebook. More likely a couple of teenagers messing around, Mr. Haskins. No need to worry. But something about those furrows nagged at me. Something about their size and depth. Will finished, patted Ronald on the shoulder, and headed to the car. I hesitated. It was stupid, just a small-town cop's overactive imagination, but I followed those tracks a bit deeper into the woods bordering the Haskins' place. Twilight made everything long and shadowy. Birds flitted nervously amongst the branches and a damp, earthy smell filled the air. Then I saw it. A flash of movement in the underbrush, too big to be a deer, too bulky to be a stray dog. Hey! I called out, my voice echoing eerily in the hushed woods. Anybody there? Silence. But I hadn't imagined the movement. Something was watching me. I drew my gun and stepped cautiously forward, heart pounding then I heard it. A low growl that made the hair stand up on the back of my neck, and then a heavy thumping sound, heavy footfalls that weren't quite human. The underbrush crackled and a massive shape loomed out of the darkness. I swear it was at least seven feet tall, hunched, its form thick with coarse, dark fur. Beady yellow eyes glinted at me, filled with animalistic hunger, and its mouth curled into a snarl, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth. I stumbled back, gun raised and shaking. It lunged at me, a blur of claws and teeth. I fired off two shots in a panic. The creature roared, 
a bone-chilling sound that sent me scrambling for cover behind a fallen tree. The creature stalked towards my hiding place, those yellow eyes focused in deadly intent. I couldn't see where the bullets had hit. Whatever this thing was, it didn't seem to be slowed down one bit. It was almost on top of me. Then a shout. Harper! You all right? What came crashing through the trees, gun drawn. His presence seemed to startle the creature. It hesitated, glanced between Will and me, and then vanished back into the woods with uncanny speed. Will reached me, breathing heavily. What the hell was that? I, I don't know. I stammered, still trembling. I could hardly believe what I'd just seen. Will surveyed the area, guns still raised. Looks like we got more than a missing grandma on our hands. Whatever that was, it ain't natural. We followed the creature's tracks deeper into the woods, but the trail gradually faded into dense undergrowth. The sun was dipping below the horizon, casting an ominous glow over the trees. We had searched for nearly an hour, but all we found were a few spots of dark blood staining the leaves. Back at the Haskins' house, more deputies had arrived, combing through the woods, but nobody could find Mrs. Haskins. Ronald hovered anxiously, his face drained of color. My mother! It took her, didn't it? That, that thing. He choked out the words, tears welling in his eyes. I didn't have an answer. In my gut I knew that Lucille Haskins was gone. Word spread quickly through the town. That night, no one slept soundly in Red Bluff. Doors were triple locked, lights blazed from windows, and shotguns were loaded with a sense of foreboding the town had never experienced. The next few days turned into a blur. We set up search parties, combed through those woods till our boots ached. More of my fellow deputies and even a few volunteers from neighboring towns, all ready to take down the creature, joined in. News stations descended on Red Bluff, thirsty for a story. It became a full-blown media circus. We had a couple of reported sightings, blurred photos taken from a distance, but nothing we could definitively track. It was as though the creature had vanished into thin air. Then, another disappearance. This time it was a teenage boy, Danny Cooper, vanished while hiking a trail just outside of town. All we found was a ripped backpack and more of the strangely large tracks amidst signs of a struggle. People's fear turned to anger, directed squarely at the sheriff's department. Why couldn't we catch this thing? Why was it still out there? I understood their fear shared it even. Because the truth was, we were completely out of our depth. A week into the disappearances, Will and I were on patrol, cruising a stretch of road bordering the woods. We gotta do something, Harper, Will said, breaking the tense silence that had settled over us. Can't just let folks keep disappearing. I know, I said grimly. But what? We can't even track this thing properly, let alone kill it. I didn't like admitting it, but he was right. Maybe not, Will said slowly, a thoughtful look on his face. But maybe we don't have to. His eyes gleamed, and suddenly that damn country music didn't seem so annoying. Then he explained his plan. We had to use something the creature wanted. Bait. Ronald Haskins had been surprisingly composed after his mother's disappearance. Grief mixed with a chilling sort of resignation. I found him on his porch late one afternoon, staring out at the ominously silent woods. Mr. Haskins, can I speak with you for a moment? I asked. He turned and regarded me with tired eyes. Not much left to say, is there? Just hear me out. I said and laid out my plan. Will and a couple of other deputies would be waiting in the woods, carefully concealed. Haskins would remain at his house, 
a solitary figure easily visible from the woods, vulnerable prey. It was a desperate gamble, but our only one. Haskins listened intently, a flicker of something like hope in his eyes. He hesitated only a moment before nodding. If it gives you a chance to catch that thing, for my mother and Danny, I'll do it. That night, everything was eerily still. Will and the others were already hidden within the woods. The moon hung full and heavy in the sky, illuminating Haskins' house with ghostly light. I was positioned outside, concealed within a stand of trees, trying to ignore the cold sweat trickling down my spine. We waited. Minutes turned into hours. The hair on the back of my neck prickled, the woods alive with the sense of being watched. And then it emerged from the tree line, a silhouette even more monstrous in the clear moonlight. Its gait was deliberate, predatory, each step bringing it closer to the house. Haskins came into view on the porch, his form stark against the white siding. The creature paused, then shifted course, heading straight towards him. I signaled Will on the radio, voice barely a whisper. It's moving. Get ready. As the creature reached the yard, the woods suddenly erupted in gunfire. It roared in fury and confusion, caught in the crossfire. I saw flashes of fur and claws, those haunting yellow eyes swirling with rage as it tried to thrash its way free. And then, as suddenly it had started, the gunfire ceased. Silence. I rushed forward, heart pounding, gun drawn. A wave of nausea nearly overwhelmed me as I approached the clearing. The ground was torn up, splattered with blood, but there was no sign of the creature. Haskins was alive, slumped against the wall of his house, eyes wide with shock but miraculously unharmed. The creature had vanished once again, leaving behind only the lingering scent of blood and cordite. It was as though it had melted into the shadows. A thorough search of the area in the morning light revealed nothing. Whatever trail we might have hoped to follow was gone. We were left with a missing creature, wounded perhaps, but still out there. In the following days, the fear in Red Bluff did not dissipate. It simmered, an unspoken dread lurking beneath the surface of normalcy. Patrols tripled, floodlights blazed all night long, and the curfew imposed after the first attacks remained strictly enforced. I spent my days off combing old hunting books and internet forums, desperate for clues. Myths and legends of strange creatures, sightings that sounded eerily familiar. There had to be something— a pattern or a weakness, anything that could lead us to that thing in the woods. Then, a month later, another disappearance. This time it wasn't a hiker or a lone resident on the town's outskirts. It was Tim Wallace, Red Bluff High Star quarterback, snatched from his bed in the middle of the night. His bedroom window was smashed open, the curtains billowing in the breeze as his horrified parents stumbled out of their room too late. The town finally snapped. The anger simmering beneath the surface erupted. A mob gathered outside the sheriff's department, demanding answers, accusing us of incompetence. Mayor Thompson tried to calm them, but when rocks started flying through the windows, we were forced to disperse them with tear gas. Will came by my apartment that night, a six-pack of cheap beer in hand. He slumped onto my worn-out sofa and stared bleakly ahead. This is it, Harper, he said. This town is finished. Folks will start leaving in droves, businesses will close. Hell, if I didn't have fifteen years till retirement, I'd be packing my bags, too. I couldn't disagree. The creature— Whatever it was, had broken us. We were powerless against it. And now, the very fabric of Red Bluff was tearing apart. The next evening, Will and I were on patrol again. The streets were eerily quiet. 
Every closed storefront, every darkened house was a constant reminder of what we'd failed to protect. We drove in silence for what seemed like hours until a flicker of movement at the edge of the road made us break suddenly. Standing in the dim glow cast by our headlights was Ronald Haskins, a shotgun gripped tightly in his hands. His face was gaunt, eyes filled with a terrifying resolve. You two need to see this, he said voice raspy. Without waiting for a response, he turned and disappeared into the woods. We exchanged wary glances but followed. Ronald led us at a relentless pace, his familiarity with the woods evident even in the darkness. Finally, he stopped before a massive oak tree, so old it must have stood sentinel over these woods for centuries. It sleeps here, Haskins whispered, gesturing to the base of the tree. A crude, makeshift blind made of branches and leaves had been meticulously woven around its gnarled roots. Will trained his flashlight into the gloom and a collective gasp escaped us. Nestled amidst the thick foliage was a crude offering torn pieces of clothing, a mangled backpack, belongings scavenged from its victims. And beneath, an opening in the earth, a dark, yawning hole that led into the unknown. Ronald Haskins turned to face us. When it took my mother, I swore, I swore I'd make it pay. He lifted the shotgun, the moonlight glinting on the barrel. It ends tonight. Will and I shared a loaded glance. This was beyond anything we were equipped to deal with, and yet the determination on Haskins' face mirrored our own festering need for something resembling justice. Silently, we crouched beside him. The air grew thick with tension, every rustle of leaves amplified into a monstrous threat. The minutes stretched into an eternity, the darkness pressing heavy upon us. Then that low, guttural growl. It resonated from the depths of the pit, shaking the ground beneath us. The blind began to shake violently as the creature stirred. Ronald Haskins tightened his grip on the shotgun. His hour of reckoning had arrived. A massive clawed hand emerged first, followed by a hulking, fur-covered form. The creature rose to its full height, a grotesque parody of a living thing. The gunfire erupted instantly, the noise deafening in the enclosed space. Orange flashes lit up the darkness as the creature roared with a mixture of pain and fury. It lurched forward, massive jaws snapping in blind rage. Then, as suddenly as it had begun, it slumped with a bone-jarring thud. Silence descended once more. Cautiously, we approached, flashlights cutting through the darkness. The creature lay at the base of the tree, riddled with bullet wounds. Its once fearsome yellow eyes were now glazed, the light of its malevolent life extinguished at last. We dragged the creature out into the clearing, and the true horror of what we'd been dealing with was laid bare. Its size, its strength, it was beyond anything I could have imagined. The aftermath was a whirlwind. Wildlife experts from across the state descended upon Red Bluff. The creature was examined, debated, classified, yet it defied all known categories. News channels went into a frenzy, desperate for interviews, analysis, anything to quench the public's thirst for answers. Ronald Haskins became a reluctant hero, though the lines of grief and trauma etched across his face told a far more complicated story. Will Tarkin, nearing retirement, put his papers in early, opting for a quiet fishing cabin far away from Red Bluff and its shadowed woods. For me, things were different. After what I'd seen, what I'd been through, patrolling the streets of a sleepy town didn't seem enough anymore. I turned in my badge and enrolled in the academy. Years later, I'm with a specialized FBI division, the sort dealing with cases the Bureau prefers to keep off the books. Cases involving things that defy easy explanation, things that go bump in the night. 
Red Bluff slowly recovered, though it was forever changed by the events of that summer. New businesses moved in, new families arrived. But the old-timers, they never looked at the woods the same way again. And on quiet nights, when the fog rolls in thick, they swear they can still hear that low, menacing growl echoing through the trees. Because out there in the vast wilderness, who knows what else might be lurking, waiting for its chance? I do, and I'll be ready. This happened to me on June 19, 1993. It's one of those memories you try to bury, but it always finds a way to bubble back up, especially at night. They say time heals all wounds, but sometimes it just leaves a nasty scar. I was with the LAPD then, still pretty green, and let me tell you, Nothing I learned at the academy prepared me for what I found in those woods near Topanga Canyon. I grew up in the valley, so I knew about Topanga, the hippies squatting in old buses, the rumors of weird rituals out there under the full moon. But mostly, it was just a popular hiking spot for outdoors types and weekend wannabe shamans. We'd get called out every so often to clear out a tripped-out trespasser, maybe deal with a domestic dispute in one of the trailer parks tucked deeper into the hills, that sort of thing. Everything changed with the first report. Two hikers gone missing. Now, that's not necessarily unusual, even in well-marked areas like Topanga State Park. People get disoriented, accidents happen. But then, we found their packs torn open along one of the trails, Bits of bloody clothing scattered amongst the underbrush. No bodies, just traces. And this unsettling feeling, like the whole canyon was watching us. A search party was formed, volunteers helping deputies comb the densely wooded hillsides. My partner, Jack McCord, older, cynical, with a beer gut pushing against his uniform, wasn't impressed with the mountain men joining us. Lot of camo and conspiracy theories ain't gonna find those folks, kid. He'd grumble. Truthfully, I couldn't shake the sense something was seriously off. The missing hikers were young, relatively experienced, not the types to wander off a clearly marked trail. And whatever attacked them was brutal and strong. Animal attack was the go-to guess, a mountain lion maybe, but it didn't fit with the messiness of it all. The second disappearance hit a week later. Single victim this time, a trail runner. His campsite was ripped to shreds, tent fabric shredded, and large patches of ground were scorched like something hot had been dragged over it. Then we found the runner's arm. Or rather, what was left of it. Severed below the shoulder, the bone jagged as if gnawed clean through. The news hit the city like a bomb. Suddenly, Topanga Canyon was shut down, nightly patrols set up on the access roads. The media had a field day, tossing around theories from cults to escaped zoo animals. Me and Jack got called up for one of the roadblocks, a boring twelve-hour shift under the hot California sun. Jack spent most of the time nursing a big gulp and ranting about how the overtime pay wasn't worth having to babysit a bunch of scared suburbanites. I was getting antsy too when a weathered old pickup rumbled towards our checkpoint. The guy behind the wheel looked like he hadn't shaved since the Reagan administration. Name's Zeke, he grunted, thrusting a crumpled ID through the cracked window. Live up in the hills. Seen some things you city boys wouldn't believe. McCord rolled his eyes, but I figured what the hell. Like what, exactly? Zeke leaned forward, his voice dropping to a secretive whisper. It ain't right. What's been happening? Ain't natural. This land has old ways. And sometimes those old ways wake up hungry-like. I glanced at McCord 
expecting him to tell the old guy to shove off, but he was staring at Zeke with something like interest flickering across his face. Hungry for what? I asked before I could help myself. Zeke's gaze slid towards the woods lining the road, a shiver running down his spine. For folk like those hikers, like your runner. It needs feeding, see, or it gets angry. That's the bargain of this place. His voice was barely above a mumble. I shared another look with McCord, the unspoken tension buzzing between us. We both heard the whispers, legends about this canyon that predated the Spanish settlers. But to hear someone say it with such conviction, out loud, it changed things. All right, Zeke, McCord said, handing back the ID. You keep an eye out, and let us know if you see anything, well, unusual. It wasn't exactly dismissive, more like he was leaving a door cracked open. Zeke nodded gravely and shifted his truck back into gear. As he rumbled off, I got this prickling sensation on my neck, a certainty that old Zeke, crazy as he sounded, knew a hell of a lot more than he was letting on. I was about to suggest to McCord that we check in with the old guy, but a call crackled over the radio, urgency in the dispatcher's voice. All units possible sighting at the old creek trailhead. Suspect matches description of reported attacks. Multiple injuries. Adrenaline surged through me. McCord gunned the engine, tires spitting gravel as we roared off down the canyon road. Minutes later, we screeched into the trailhead parking lot. Three hikers sat on a bench, one clutching a bloody rag to his shoulder, another pale-faced and vomiting into the bushes. They told a horrifying story. They'd been hiking, sticking to the main trail, when this thing burst out of the undergrowth. Fast, massive, covered in coarse, dark hair. Claws, teeth, guttural roars. They said it was at least seven feet tall, strong enough to fight off all three of them. Did you get a look at its face? I asked voice tight, the image of that severed arm flashing through my mind. The uninjured hiker, a reedy guy with thick-rimmed glasses, shook his head wildly. No, it was all blur and teeth. McCord radioed for more backup, and within the hour... The trailhead was swarming with deputies, park rangers, the works. A K-9 unit had picked up the creature's scent, leading us deeper into the woods. We followed, loaded rifles in hand, the dense foliage closing in around us with every step. The sun dipped towards the horizon, casting long, ominous shadows across our path. The forest had gone eerily quiet, the usual chirps and rustles of critters absent. Then that low growl echoed through the trees. My blood ran cold. It was close. A flicker of movement ahead. It hunched beneath a canopy of branches, gnawed like a massive, twisted hand. It turned slowly, revealing its face, and I felt a scream claw up my throat. Yellow eyes, blazing with bestial hunger, locked on to mine. Its snout was long, filled with rows of jagged teeth. It hunched close to the ground, yet easily towered over me. Impossibly long limbs tipped with razor-sharp claws twitched, ready to strike. Jesus! McCord breathed beside me, his voice a strangled whisper. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't an escaped bear or a drugged-out mountain man. It was something out of a nightmare. Pure, primal terror seized me. I fumbled for my rifle, training it on the creature as it let out a deafening roar that reverberated through the trees. Then it lunged. I stumbled backwards, squeezing off a shot more out of blind panic than any hope of aiming true. The bullet grazed its shoulder, drawing a thick spurt of blood that looked black in the fading daylight. The creature snarled, pain mixing with its rage, and swiped a massive paw in my direction. I felt searing pain and flew backwards, 
landing hard against a tree. My rifle clattered out of reach. The world spun, the trees blurring into streaks of green and brown. McCord shouted something, but it sounded distant. My ears were filled with the thunderous beating of my own heart. Through my haze of pain, I saw the creature stalk towards me. It moved with deceptive speed, its injured shoulder barely slowing it down. I fumbled at my belt for the backup pistol but felt an agonizing wave of nausea wash over me as my hand came away sticky with blood. This was it. I was going to die in this godforsaken canyon, ripped apart by, by whatever this monster was. A flicker of memory sparked, the image of that severed arm, the jagged bone. The creature loomed above me, breath hot and fetid, its claws glinting in the gathering darkness. Then, the crack of rifle fire split the air. Not a single shot, but a barrage, echoing off the canyon walls. The creature screeched and stumbled back, hit by multiple rounds. I craned my neck, blinking hard to clear my vision. A cluster of dark figures stood at the edge of the clearing, long rifles raised. One of them barked orders, and more bullets rained down on the beast. It staggered, roared in fury and confusion, then lurched for the undergrowth and disappeared with a final, echoing snap of branches. Harper, you all right? McCord was at my side, face tight with worry. Another figure knelt next to me, the scent of pine needles and tobacco making my stomach churn. Old Zeke, his rifle still smoking in his hands. Zeke, I gasped, my voice a hoarse whisper. What the hell? But the old man was already on his feet, scanning the treeline, his weathered face grim. It'll be back, he said. Wounded cornered, that makes it dangerous. We gotta finish this before nightfall. I struggled to get up, but a wave of dizziness forced me back down. I... I think it got me good, I said, shame mixing with the rising panic in my chest. I lifted my shirt to reveal a deep, jagged gash across my side. Blood soaked through the makeshift bandage someone had hastily put on. Damn, McCord swore, turning to the other figures now emerging from the trees. We gotta get him out of here. It was the search volunteers, the camo guys, he had mocked earlier. But now they were our lifeline. Two of them carefully fashioned a makeshift stretcher from branches and jackets. They hoisted me onto it, and we began the slow, grueling trek back to the trailhead. With every step, the pain pulsed in my side, but I bit back the groans, focusing instead on the darkening sky. Zeke led the way, shotgun at the ready. McCord and the others formed a protective circle around me, their faces a mixture of fear and grim determination. The creature stalked us from the shadows, its eerie growls sending chills down my spine. We caught glimpses of it slinking between the trees, those burning yellow eyes fixated on us. When we reached the trailhead, an ambulance was waiting. Relief washed over me. Maybe I'd make it out of this after all. The EMTs rushed over, cutting away my blood-soaked clothes, packing the wound. As they loaded me into the ambulance, I saw Zeke slip into the shadows, merging back into the domain he seemed to know as well as his own backyard. The hospital was a blur of fluorescent lights, sterile smells, and too many medical questions. They stitched me up and pumped me full of antibiotics and painkillers. I spent the next few days drifting in and out of a haze, the nightmares worse than the reality. Claws, fangs, and those haunting yellow eyes. When I was finally coherent, McCord was waiting by my bed. He looked like he hadn't slept in a week. The creature? I asked, voice still raspy. McCord ran a hand over his stubbled face. Never found it. Even with trackers' dogs, it was like it vanished into thin air. 
Zeke? I asked. He nodded. Old man came by a few times. Says it ain't over that the creature's just lying low, biding its time. A shiver ran through me. I knew he was right. Whatever that thing was, it was still out there, lurking in the depths of Topanga Canyon. After my release from the hospital, I never went back on active duty. The doctor said I made a miraculous recovery, but something inside me had changed. I handed in my badge, moved across the state, and took a quiet desk job with a small-town department. Small towns have their own crimes, their own darkness, but it's a darkness I can comprehend. The nightmares faded with time, became less frequent. But sometimes, when a thick fog rolls in, and the wind whispers through the trees, I feel a primal fear claw at my gut. And I remember those yellow eyes, filled with a hunger that has no name. The aftermath, in a way, was simple. The story of the creature never made the papers. Authorities chalked the attacks up to wild animals, the missing folks declared. Lost in the wilderness. The canyon reopened, and hikers gradually returned, oblivious to the danger that may still be lurking just off those well-trodden trails. Maybe that was for the best. Maybe ignorance was a kind of protection. As for me, I carried the scar physical and mental, as a reminder. A reminder of the time I looked into the abyss, and it looked right back at me. And on nights when the shadows seemed to stretch a bit too long, I offer a silent thanks to grizzled old Zeke and his shotgun, for without them, that abyss would have swallowed me whole. This happened to me on October 26, 2008. You won't find it in any police report, though. Hell, half the folks in Ashton wouldn't believe it if I did file one, would probably laugh and chalk it up to old man Cooper having one too many at the tavern again. But I know what I saw, what I almost became a part of. Name's Deputy Ben Cooper. Been with this department since I was old enough to grow a decent mustache. My dad was a deputy before me, and his dad before him. Ashton, Wyoming, ain't exactly a hotbed of crime, population barely cracks 1,500. We get the occasional bar fight, some domestic disputes, but that's about the extent of it. So, when the missing persons report started coming in, well... It caused a ripple bigger than a dropped boulder in a still pond. First, it was Randall Hayes, local hunting guide. Went out with a couple of out-of-towners on a weekend trip, never came back. His truck was found up one of those old logging roads, but no sign of Randall, his clients, or whatever might have gotten them. Folks figured maybe they got lost, turned around in those woods happens to the best of us, especially when you don't know the area well. Search and rescue went out, combed those hills for days. Nothing turned up. A week later, it was young Tammy Linwood, waitress at the diner, sweet girl with an old soul. Vanished on her way home one night, her car found abandoned by the side of the road, engine still running. Now that set the whole town on edge. Two disappearances in such a short span, in a place like Ashton? That just didn't happen. The whispers began. Maybe some drifter passing through, preying on easy targets. Maybe it was a mountain lion that had gotten a taste for human flesh. Sheriff Thompson even got some calls asking if we were looking into the paranormal angle. You'd be surprised how superstitious folks get when scared. I was mostly trying to keep a lid on the growing panic, making patrols, reassuring worried residents. Part of me still thought we'd find Randall, Tammy, and those tourists alive, just disoriented and a little worse for wear. The other part, 
the part one tried to drown out with extra cups of bad diner coffee, was screaming something terrible was going on in those woods. Then came my night on the late shift. A call came through about some commotion near the old quarry. Usually that just meant teenagers getting drunk and rowdy, but given the circumstances, I figured better to check it out. The quarry sits a few miles outside of town, surrounded by pines, deep enough to have its own little ecosystem down there. Growing up, it was the place for midnight dares and stolen kisses. Now, the moonlight painted it in long, sinister shadows as I made my way down the overgrown access road. That's when I heard it, a sound like nothing I'd heard before. A low, guttural growl mixed with a shriek. My blood ran cold, and the hairs stood up on my neck. It was coming from the quarry, echoing through the trees. I pulled my cruiser to a stop, hesitated for a split second as some primeval sense screamed for me to get the hell back to town. But that oath I took, that badge, and plain old human curiosity, I suppose. I got out, drew my gun, and crept towards the edge of the quarry. What I saw will haunt me till my dying day. Down in the moonlit pit, standing under the skeletal remains of an old crane, was a monster. It was massive, easily twice the size of a full-grown grizzly. But this, this thing walked upright. Its body was covered in coarse, blackish fur, and its head was somewhere between wolf and man, elongated snout filled with rows of razor-sharp teeth, eyes that burned like hot coals in the night. It was hunched over something writhing and pale in its clawed hands. Then came the unmistakable sound of bones snapping and the squelch of flesh tearing. A scream cut through the air, a human scream, before abruptly ending with a sickening gurgle. Bao rose in my throat, and I nearly revealed my position. One of those missing tourists, I realized with horror. The creature was feeding. Some primal instinct must have kicked in, a mix of terror and outrage. I raised my gun, hands trembling, and fired off a shot. The sound cracked through the night. Maybe I hit it, maybe I didn't. The creature whirled towards me, a snarl peeling back its lips, revealing blood-soaked teeth. Then, impossibly, it charged. Up the quarry wall, its speed terrifying. I turned and bolted for my cruiser, fumbled the keys as that god-awful roar grew closer. I tore off, tires spitting gravel as I put that place as far behind me as my old Crown Vic could take me. Back at the station, I told Sheriff Thompson what I saw. He looked at me like I'd grown a second head. Probably figured I'd cracked under the pressure. Hell, maybe part of me did. But I swear, every word I said was the truth. Thompson sent a few deputies to check out the quarry at dawn just in case. They found nothing, of course. No sign of a struggle, no trace of that, creature. Thompson gave me a stern talking to, told me to take a few days' leave, clear my head. The whole thing was hushed up, blamed on wild animal attacks, but the disappearances stopped after that night. Maybe the creature had its fill, Maybe it moved on. Sometimes, driving through those woods, I feel eyes on me. A sense I'm being tracked by something I don't understand. And the image of that monstrous figure under the moonlight flickers behind my closed eyelids. A reminder that the world ain't always what we think it is. That there are things lurking in the shadows, things best left undisturbed. This happened to me on June 23, 2010. I was working as a deputy with the Sheriff's Department in Payson, Arizona, just a small town nestled up in the pines. Been a cop for about five years then. You'd get used to the quiet life, handle the occasional domestic dispute, 
maybe a drunk driver once in a while. Payson's the kind of place where everybody knows each other. I'm Mark Bennett. First call of the day seems simple enough. Mrs. Elwood, runs the little general goods store down on Main Street, reports a petty theft. A teenage kid nabbed a bag of chips and a candy bar. I drive out, talk to Mrs. Elwood, a sweet, elderly lady with a heart of gold and a tongue that could flay a man alive if he crossed her. Kid's name is Danny Owens, troublemaker from way back. His ma's a mess, always in and out of rehab. I know the Owens place, a rundown trailer out by the creek. Seems like the ideal place to catch young Danny red-handed. I head out, the cruiser bumping down the dirt road that winds along the creek. Trailers here aren't fancy, but the Owens place has seen better days. Windows patched up with duct tape, yard a mess of rusted car parts and old tires. The air hangs heavy with the smell of stale beer and something else I can't quite place. I knock on the warped screen door. No answer. The quiet is unnerving. Place feels empty. I walk around back, keeping an eye out. See an open window with the screen busted out. That's how Danny probably got in and out, but it sends a shiver down my spine. I call out his name again then decide to head in. Mrs. Owens, if she's home, won't like me barging in, but there's something off that I can't shake. Inside is worse than I expected. Trash furniture, beer bottles all over the floor, stains on the threadbare carpet. Looks like blood. A sense of dread settles in my gut. I hear a noise upstairs, a faint whimper. Follow the sound, gun drawn. My footsteps echo on the warped wooden floorboards. Upstairs, the kid's room is empty, his things scattered everywhere. Then I find the source of the whimpers. Huddled in a closet under a pile of dirty clothes is a little girl. No older than six or seven, with tear tracks streaking her face. My heart sinks. It's Sarah Wilson, lives a few trailers down. Went missing two days ago, nobody had any leads. I gently lift her out of the closet. She clings to me like a lifeline, her small body trembling. Where's Danny? I ask, trying to keep my voice calm. Sarah shakes her head, sobs racking her body. The, the monster, it took him. A wave of nausea washes over me. Monster? What the hell does that mean? I get Sarah out of the trailer, into the cruiser, and call it in, report Mrs. Owens missing, Sarah Wilson found, and a possible child abduction in progress. My voice trembles as I say the words Sarah told me. Backup arrives fast small town cops stick together. We toss the Owens place but find nothing except more signs of a struggle, of something, wrong. The sun's already starting to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows. We search the woods till nightfall, but Danny's nowhere to be seen. We put out an APB, but as the hours stretch into the night, the pit in my stomach tells me it's too late. Something monstrous is out there in the twilight. Something I never imagined I might face. Next morning, they call an AK-9 unit from the city. The dog picks up a scent trail heading into the denser part of the pine forest towards the old Mogollon Rim. I'm part of the team that follows, a knot of tension in my chest. The pines grow thick, filtering out the sunlight. The air hangs humid and still. Every rustle of leaves sounds like a footfall. Every branch cracking sounds like a hungry growl. The dog leads us through the maze of trees for hours. Then, up ahead, it starts barking, straining at the leash. My heart pounds a heavy rhythm in my ears. I push through the undergrowth and into a clearing. There, on the ground, is something that makes my blood run cold. It's Danny Owens, what's left of him anyway. His clothes are torn, 
his body twisted into an unnatural shape, like a broken doll tossed aside. The dog circles him, whining anxiously. The sight's enough to make a seasoned cop lose his lunch, but I force myself to focus, to examine the scene with all the training I can muster. Around his body are massive footprints, not animal, not human. Whatever did this was huge, powerful, and utterly vicious. One of the guys with me swears under his breath. Another makes the sign of the cross, his face pale. I search for something, anything that makes sense. But the truth is, there's no explanation for this, not one the textbooks prepared me for. I get on the radio, voice barely a whisper. I describe the wounds, the footprints, trying to keep my composure. On the other end of the line, there's silence for a long moment. Then, the chief clears his throat. Bennett, he says, his voice grim. Meet us back at the station. We need to talk. Back at the station, the atmosphere feels heavy with dread. The canine handler tells us what he knows, what the dog smelled, decay, and an underlying scent of rotting meat clinging to Danny's remains. That chilling detail settles in my bones. The chief calls in a specialist, a grizzled park ranger named Walker who's worked the area for decades. He's the closest thing Payson has to an expert on the wilderness. Walker listens impassively. His sun-worn face creased in thought, then says what we're all too scared to admit out loud. That ain't no animal I know of. His voice is low, rough. Something's out there. Something that don't belong in these woods. A cold fear slithers down my spine. We spend the rest of the day planning search parties, roadblocks, warning folks in the more remote areas. Payson doesn't sleep well that night. The shadows grow long and twisted. Every creak and groan of a house takes on a sinister tone. Next morning, I'm out at first light. We comb the forest in concentric circles, widening out from where Danny's body was found. The pines stretch on for miles, whispering with secrets the sunlight can't reach. Tension hangs thick, making me jumpy. I know I'm not the only one. Every rustle of underbrush seems pregnant with menace. Hours go by, fruitless, agonizing hours. Then, over the radio, I hear my name called in a panicked voice. It's Johnson, one of the deputies I grew up with. His location isn't far from mine. I start running, heart in my throat. When I reach the clearing, I understand the fear in Johnson's voice. The scene is even more horrific than Danny's. Two hikers, a young couple from Phoenix, ripped to shreds, barely recognizable as human. And those same inhuman footprints circled around their bodies like a vulture. I swallow back the bow rising in my throat. My hands tremble as I take photos for evidence. The forest feels suffocating, filled with unseen eyes. I radio in. Tell them what I found. Chief's voice crackles back, grim as death. Pull out, Bennett. All units pull out. We ain't dealing with nothing we can handle. We retreat, but the forest seems to cling to us like burrs. It's in the haunted look in my partner's eyes, in the way the trees seem to lean in. Every snap of a twig underfoot sends my pulse racing. Back in town... A quiet terror descends upon Payson. Kids aren't allowed outside. Doors are double-bolted at night. Local hunters, those usually brash and boisterous men, suddenly go silent. News crews descend like flies, hungry for the story and the rising body count. Walker calls in some favors, gets us reinforcements from the city, even a few federal agents. They come armed with heavy-duty rifles and night-vision equipment, determined faces set beneath tactical helmets. For a brief moment, we feel hopeful. Like maybe, just maybe, 
these guys can handle whatever monstrosity hides in our woods. Those hopes are cruelly dashed. The attacks continue, growing bolder and more frequent. The monster, whatever it is, learns our patterns, strikes where we're weakest. It picks off a lone patrolman, ambushes an FBI team, shreds them apart with the same terrible strength. We find the bodies, but the feds leave. They cut their losses and return to the city lights. Leave us, the small-town cops, to face the darkness alone. The monster becomes a part of life in Payson, an ugly, twisted part. We don't talk about it much, not aloud at least, but it colors everything we do. The general store closes early. Kids don't play in the street after dusk. Hunters don't venture into those cursed woods anymore. We patrol in pairs, always on edge, knowing every radio call might be our last. Some people leave Payson. Can't say I blame them. I think about it sometimes, too. I've got a cousin in Phoenix, a sister in Flagstaff. Could start over somewhere new, somewhere where the shadows don't whisper of hungry claws but most of us stay. This is our home. We dig in, stubborn as ever. The months bleed into years, the attacks less frequent but no less brutal. We never get a good look at the beast, just fleeting glimpses in the night. Massive, lumbering on two legs, eyes glinting in the darkness like dying embers. Some believe it's a bear, driven mad with disease. Others whisper rumors of old Native American curses, or skinwalkers, or things even less savory. I try not to listen, try to stick to the facts. But the facts are that we're powerless, that the monster still rules the trees. And the aftermath? I guess it hasn't happened yet, at least not completely. Some wounds never heal, some scars never fade. Me? I got a few new gray hairs. Payson's got a lot less people and a lot more locked doors. Once in a while, something disappears off the edges of town a dog, sometimes a drifter passing through. We don't talk about it. We bury the memory deep, along with all the ones we've lost. And we wait, we watch, we endure. This happened to me on June 19, 1995. Been with the department in Clifton, West Virginia, for a little over seven years back then. Clifton ain't much. One main street, a diner that could win an award for greasy spoons, and a whole lot of trees rustling all around us. Everybody knows everybody's business in a place like this. My name's Joe Tanner. Married my high school sweetheart, got two kids now. Life's pretty ordinary, which suits me just fine most days. First call of the day seems simple enough, noise complaint at the old Blackwood place up on the ridge. It's a rambling, half-dilapidated Victorian mansion with a reputation as the local haunted house. Blackwood family died off years ago, and the place has stayed empty. Word is, some rich city folks bought it to turn it into some fancy bed and breakfast, but nothing happened. Still, teenagers being teenagers, the house attracts its share of late-night visitors and tales of spooky noises. I roll my eyes, but hey, it's my job. Drive up there, cruiser bumping over the unpaved road that winds through the woods. The Blackwood Place looms up on the ridge all turrets and peeling paint, like something out of a horror movie. I get out, walk up the overgrown path. The old porch sags dangerously. Place looks deserted as a tomb. I knock, no answer. Figures. Call it in, routine noise complaint, no response. Turn to go, and that's when I hear it. A faint sound from inside the house, like a muffled cry. 
Something about it sends a chill down my spine. Place may be derelict, but there's someone in there, and they don't sound too happy. I draw my weapon, force the creaky front door. Insides dim and dusty. Floorboards groan ominously under my boots. Cobwebs drape over everything, the smell of mildew clogging the air. I move slowly from room to room, listening. Cry comes again, clearer this time. Upstairs. The second floor is worse, shadows clinging to every corner. My footsteps echo hollowly in the dead air. Up here, rooms branch off in a maze. I take them one by one, methodical and cautious. At the end of the hallway, a door stands ajar. Behind it, the crying grows louder, punctuated by a low guttural growl that makes the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. I steal my nerve and push the door open. Rooms almost bare, just a broken bed frame in the corner and an overturned chair. A young woman, maybe early twenties, sits huddled in the far corner, sobbing hysterically. There's a chain wrapped around her ankle, bolted to the floor. And beside her, my stomach lurches. It's the biggest dog I've ever seen, massive even on all fours. But it's not any dog breed I recognize. Its coat is patchy black fur, its muzzle too long, its teeth huge and yellowed. It's staring at me with eyes that gleam red in the gloom. My mind scrambles. Rabies? Maybe. It lunges for me, and I fire twice, three times. The gunshots sound like cannons in the small room. The creature snarls and jerks against its chain, but it doesn't hit the ground. Blood spatters the floor, but it seems barely phased. My ears ring from the noise. The woman screams, something about it being too late. I grab her, try to drag her out of the room, but she's fighting me, eyes wild. The creature strains at its chain, lunging again. I fire off one more desperate shot. It hits the chain, and with a rusty shriek of metal, the bolt tears free from the rotten wood. The thing lurches towards us. I don't even think, just shove the woman back toward the door and slam it shut. For a heart-stopping moment, all I hear is snarling and clawing at the wood. Then I grab the woman and drag her down the hallway, running for our lives. Back down the creaky stairs, fumbling with the front door. Every creak of wood sounds like the creature breaking through. We stumble out onto the porch, and I force myself to stop. Got a call for backup, but my radio's dead. Static fills the earpiece, nothing else. I turn back to the house, and then silence. The snarling has stopped. I help the woman down the steps. Her legs are shaking so hard she can barely stand. She's clutching a crumpled piece of paper, sobbing about her brother and how he found the monster in the woods. That's when I see the blood staining her jeans below one knee. We make it down the driveway and into the trees just as I hear the splintering crash of wood. That thing broke through the door. I lead the woman through the tangle of undergrowth, heart pounding a frantic tattoo in my chest. Every crackle of a branch sounds like the creature hot on our heels. She whimpers, slowing us down, mumbling incoherently about her brother lost in the woods. Finally, we reach the road. I pray. And sure enough, headlights appear in the distance. A pickup truck, a local farmer I recognize. I flag him down, and he slams on the brakes, eyes wide. We pile into the truck, and I give him a frantic summary. Injured woman, monster, the Blackwood place. He doesn't even question it, just floors the gas and tears down the dirt road doesn't slow down until we reach the main street of Clifton. The station's in chaos when we arrive. Everyone knows something's wrong. I try to get a coherent story out, 
but it comes out in a jumbled rush of snarls and teeth and red eyes. The chief doesn't doubt me for a second. He rallies the crew, a ragtag team of small-town cops never meant to face anything like this. The sun's setting, casting long shadows. We load up on weaponry and head back, a caravan of cruisers with flickering lights. The woman, Sarah was her name, is in a police car behind us, pale as a ghost and with a hastily bandaged leg. The air crackles with tension up at the Blackwood place. We form a perimeter. Guns are drawn, but every shadow holds the threat of those red eyes and gleaming teeth. Chief tells me to stay with Sarah, but I shake my head. This is my mess, and I need to finish it. I take position beside Johnson, an older guy but steady under pressure. The silence is so thick I could cut it with a knife. Then, a growl, low and guttural, from the tree lean. The creature steps into view. Even in the twilight, it's massive, a hulking form of muscle and matted fur. It snarls, revealing a maw dripping with blood. Not Sarah's, I pray. The chief gives the order. Shots ring out, a deafening volley. The creature staggers back, but it keeps coming. It lurches from side to side, but it's still on its feet. We keep firing. One shot catches it in the shoulder, another in the leg, but it seems barely slowed. Fear clenches my gut. We're running out of time, out of ammo. I empty my revolver. The smell of gunpowder hangs heavy in the air. Then I remember the flashlight. It's one of those heavy-duty metal ones, weighs a good few pounds. I raise it, charge forward, a desperate scream tearing out of my throat. I slam the flashlight into the creature's head. It roars, stumbling back, one of its red eyes gleaming. I swing again, then again, battering it with all my strength. There's a sickening crack as the flashlight connects with its skull. The creature falters, but recovers fast, shaking its head. I scramble back just as it lunges. Johnson jumps in, covering me with another barrage of gunfire. Finally, the creature stumbles and collapses. It thrashes on the ground for a few moments, then lies still. The silence that descends is deafening. We stand there, panting, staring down at the carcass. It's still not fully believable, even seeing it dead. The chief kneels down, examines the beast. His hand trembles as he pulls something from the creature's fur. A dog tag, tarnished and old. We flip it over. There's a name etched on it, Shadow. Sarah whimpers from the car, and that's when it hits me. The brother she was rambling about, the one who found the monster. He found a lost dog. The dog that probably turned feral after the house was abandoned. Whatever it is, it's not supernatural. We take the carcass back to the station. Vets from the surrounding counties come to examine it. Tests run for weeks, DNA compared against every known breed. No match. Nothing close. They label it Canis Unknown, a tragic case of a dog driven mad or perhaps twisted by disease. The aftermath? Well, that's a little less clear-cut. The Blackwood place is condemned. The city owners quietly drop their plans. News vans camp out for a couple of days, but there's no juicy monster story to spin, so they leave. Sarah gets treatment, a long rehab for her leg, longer still for her haunted eyes. She doesn't talk much about her brother. I don't ask. Clifton quiets down, the way it always does. But things don't ever quite settle back to normal. When a dog barks too loud at night, people flinch. Shadows in the woods seem a little darker. Johnson swears off hunting, says the deer ain't worth the risk anymore. As for me, I stay with the force another few years. Keep a flashlight in my cruiser, 
right next to the gun, just in case. Life goes on, and for the most part, it's good. My kids grow up. We have barbecues in the backyard on summer nights. But sometimes, when the breeze rustles the trees just right, and I see that flicker of movement out the corner of my eye, a chill goes down my spine. And I wonder, somewhere out in those deep, dark woods, if maybe, just maybe, there are things science can't explain. This happened to me on June 14, 2002, back when I was a rookie deputy with the Sheriff's Department in Alpine, Texas. A dusty, small town, right on the edge of the sprawling Chihuahuan desert miles of rocks, sand, and the occasional stubborn cactus. I'm Sam Carter. Always loved it here, despite the heat and boredom. Seemed like I'd spend my whole career handling cattle disputes and the occasional drunk and disorderly. This call was different. Mrs. Montoya, an elderly woman who lives out at the edge of town, reports hearing screams coming from the desert wash behind her property. Now, these desert arroyos are treacherous, especially after dark. Flash floods can sweep through without warning. Mrs. Montoya's worried one of those migrant groups crossing the border might be in trouble. Roll my eyes, but hey, it's my job. It's already close to sundown when I pull up to Mrs. Montoya's little adobe house. She's waiting on the porch, wringing her hands. Gives me another earful about the screams. I take a deep breath, trying to stay patient. Ma'am, could have been coyotes or maybe some kids messing around. But she's adamant, swears she knows what human screams sound like, swears someone's out there and needs help. Something about her earnestness gives me pause. Hike out back, following the line of the dry wash, flashlight weaving in the gathering gloom. The desert looks different at night, shadows playing tricks on the eyes. Every rustle of dry brush sounds magnified. Still, I find myself calling out, figuring if someone is stuck in the wash, I want them to know helps here. No answer, just a low howl of the desert wind. I'm about to head back and tell Mrs. Montoya I didn't find anything when I hear it. A scream, faint, but definitely human this time. And it sounds like it's coming from below me. Shine my flashlight into the wash. It drops about eight feet to a sandy creek bed. And that's when I see the opening. A cave, or maybe a mine shaft, half concealed by a tumble of rocks. Didn't even notice it when it was light out. The scream echoes again, muffled and desperate. Pull out my radio and call it in, but there's just static. Must be the interference from the hills. I curse under my breath. Then again, if there was an injured person, they didn't sound like they'd last long out there alone. Decision made, I climb down into the wash. The cave mouth is narrow, only a few feet high. I crouch low and shine my flashlight inside. It's damp and stale smelling, with an earthen floor and rough-hewn walls. My heart starts pounding. There's something wrong here, something my gut says isn't right. But the screams echo again, closer this time. I take a deep breath and push my way in. The tunnel slopes down, twisting and turning for what feels like forever. Must have been some old mine that collapsed, judging by the crumbling support beams. The air grows thin, making me gasp for breath. And then... Up ahead I see a faint light, a pale, sickly yellow. My legs feel like lead but I push on, drawn by those cries for help. Round a bend in the tunnel, and it opens out slightly. I stop dead. It's hard to see at first, the light pulsating strangely. Then my eyes adjust, and a wave of horror washes over me. In the center of a small chamber, a group of people— 
But that's not quite the right word. Creatures. Hulking and misshapen, squatting on their haunches with skin stretched tight over bone, like nothing human I've ever seen. They're hunched over something in the center of the chamber, a mangled body, barely recognizable. It takes me a moment to process the blood, the, the feast they're having. One of them looks up, straight at me. Its eyes glow a fiery orange in the dimness, its mouth twists into a snarl of needle-like teeth. I stumble back, screaming involuntarily. Behind me, I hear the scrabbling of feet on stone. I turn and run. I don't remember much about the climb back out of the wash, just blind, desperate scrambling, half expecting to feel claws rip into my back. Finally, I stumble out into the open, gasping for air, and see Mrs. Montoya standing aghast a few feet away. I open my mouth to warn her, to tell her to run, but the words catch in my throat. There, silhouetted against the twilight, emerging from the cave, are the creatures. They move with unnatural speed, bounding across the sand. Mrs. Montoya screams. I reach for my gun, but my hands fumble. Time seems to slow as I draw my weapon. I don't think, just fire. The shots echo in the stillness, but the creatures keep coming. Mrs. Montoya bolts toward her house, but one of the creatures is too fast. It leaps, knocking her to the ground, raking its claws across her back. She cries out in pain, a high, keening wail cut short as the creature lunges for her throat. Panic turns to cold fury. I fire again, and another creature staggers. But they keep coming. My heart pounds like a trip hammer, a roar of blood in my ears. Out of the corner of my eye, I see a glint of metal, an old mining pickaxe, discarded near the cave entrance. I lunge, snatching it. One of the creatures closes in. I swing the pickaxe with everything I have, feeling the impact reverberate through my arms as it cleaves into leathery hide and bone. The creature yells and collapses, spraying black blood across the sand. But there are more. So many more. I backpedal, swinging the pickaxe wildly, trying to keep them at bay. My gun's empty, but I barely notice, lost in a haze of adrenaline and primal terror. A sharp pain lances through my ankle as something tears into my flesh. I stumble, falling backwards, and the world explodes in a kaleidoscope of fangs and claws. Then, a sound cuts through the frenzy, the roar of an engine. Headlights blaze over the crest of a hill, tires screeching. It's back up. I hear shouts, more gunshots, and the creatures falter. Some scatter back towards the cave, others slump to the ground. The rest of it blurs, paramedics swarming around me, the sharp sting of disinfectant, the echoing throb of the chopper blades taking me to the El Paso hospital. I drift in and out of consciousness, the faces of the creatures flashing behind my eyelids. The aftermath, it wasn't neat. The bodies I found disappeared overnight. Some government cleanup crew, I suspect. Explaining away the creature remains was trickier. They cooked up a story about a wild animal attack. Vet reports got fudged. Animal experts paid off. Mrs. Montoya, bless her, kept quiet in exchange for some hefty compensation. I spent weeks in the hospital, my leg in a cast, my nights haunted by nightmares. They wanted to give me therapy, hush it all up, label it PTSD. I refused. What I saw was real. I wasn't crazy, no matter how much they wanted to sweep it under the rug. When I finally got discharged, I didn't come back to Alpine. Tried being a deputy in El Paso, but it didn't fit. The city was too loud, the streets too crowded. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching me, lurking just beyond the reach of the streetlights. 
wound up buying a small ranch in West Texas, miles from anywhere. Got myself a couple of dogs for protection, big, mean ones. I keep a shotgun loaded and a searchlight handy. Sometimes, at night, I hear things in the brush. Sometimes, I swear I see eyes gleaming in the dark. But I'm ready. When the creatures come back, and they will, I'll be waiting. The doctors, the government, they think they buried the truth in that desert cave. But the truth doesn't stay buried. Some things you can't hide, no matter how hard you try. I learned that out there in the wash. One night, you might see it on the news. Rancher repels feral animal attack. Only I'll know what the reports don't say. What the news anchors with their concerned voices and sympathetic smiles don't understand. I wasn't fighting wild animals. I was fighting something older, darker. A reminder that out there, in the shadows beyond the edge of our civilized world, monsters are real. And they're hungry. This happened to me on June 19, 1999. I still remember it clearly. I was a small-town deputy in Lincoln County, Nevada. A place of rolling desert, the occasional cluster of Joshua trees, and long, lonely stretches of highway. My name is Deputy Russell Yates, been behind the badge for about seven years now. It's a quiet corner of the world, for the most part. You've got your petty theft, your drunk and disorderly, the occasional domestic dispute— Nothing out of the ordinary for a place like this. See, out here, folks tend to be the quiet type or the ones who came out here specifically to be left well enough alone. We get a few tourists passing through from time to time, mostly on their way to Vegas, but by and large, we live and let live. Now, I wouldn't call myself superstitious. But there are stories— you sit around the campfire long enough out here, you hear things. Whispers about critters that ain't quite right in the high desert, things folks saw flittering along ridgelines in the moonlight. We always laughed it off, tall tales born of boredom and too much cheap whiskey. This particular day started like any other. I pulled a double shift due to Johnson calling in sick with a mighty bad hangover. Patrol out on Highway 375, the one the UFO nuts call the extraterrestrial highway. Never understood it myself. Mostly, it was just hauling over truckers running late on their deliveries. Afternoon rolled in, and the sun was beating down something fierce. I decided to pull in at one of the dusty outposts, Mildred's Diner, for iced tea. You see... Mildred made the best darn tea in the entire county, bar none. Place was deserted save for Mildred herself behind the counter, wiping down the formica with a damp rag. Looking a bit tuckered out, Russell, she said, her voice as dry as the sagebrush. I sighed and pulled up a stool. Long night and the kind of heat that makes a man dream of rain. Something more than that she said, fixing me with a steady stare. Something's got you spooked. Now, I wouldn't say Mildred was psychic or anything, but she had a knack for reading folks. Maybe it was all those years listening to trucker gossip. I hesitated, then shrugged. It wasn't much, but it had been gnawing at me. Just a call that came in this morning. Old Mrs. Peterson out near the foothills? said she found her dog. Well, what was left of it, anyway? Torn apart all strange. Mildred shook her head. Coyotes again? Maybe. Could be mountain lions getting bold. But the way she described it. I trailed off, not wanting to sound foolish even in the dim, deserted diner. Mildred just refilled my tea glass and tapped the rim. Sometimes the things we don't say are louder than any tall tale, Russell. 
I left the diner feeling oddly unsettled. Highway 375 stretched out before me, shimmering and empty. It was getting on towards dusk, the desert painted in tones of purple and gold. Usually, this was my favorite time of day, the world cooling off, but a prickle of unease crawled down my spine. Mile markers ticked past. I scanned the horizon the way you do, out of habit more than expectation. It was then I saw it, just a flicker in the dimming light. At first, I thought it was a deer, a trick of the eye. But as I got closer, something seemed off. Too tall for a deer, hunched over, moving with a strange, jerky gait. I slowed the cruiser down to a crawl, keeping the headlights off. There was enough twilight to see the figure in stark silhouette. It was standing stock still by the side of the road, its head turned towards me. Humanoid, yet not, tall and spindly, with limbs that seemed just a touch too long. My mouth went dry. I reached for the radio, hand trembling, and barked out my location. Backup was a good thirty minutes out, at least. The figure tilted its head, and I swear, even in the twilight, I could make out its eyes, wide and luminous, reflecting back my headlights as I flipped them on in a burst of panic. And then it moved. Not like any animal I'd ever seen, not with that speed and fluidity. It closed the distance between us in a matter of seconds, scrambling up onto the hood of my cruiser, claws raking across the windshield. I cried out and slammed the vehicle in reverse, heart pounding like a rabbit's under a hawk's eye. The creature, whatever the hell it was, clung with unnatural strength, its long, bony fingers clawing for purchase. I caught a glimpse of its face, all sharp angles and impossibly wide eyes that burned like embers in the darkness. The radio crackled with the dispatcher's voice, but it was distant, drowned out by the pounding of my own terrified heart and the screeching of tearing metal. One misshapen hand smashed through the windshield, the creature lunging for me. I fumbled for my gun, firing wildly. The shots echoed across the silent desert, but the thing seemed impervious. It shrieked, a piercing, inhuman sound that sent chills down my spine. I slammed the cruiser into drive, the screech of tires tearing through the still desert air. The creature was thrown, its body tumbling along the asphalt, but it scrambled back to its feet with unnatural speed, its eyes fixed on me as I sped away. I radioed for backup again, my voice hoarse with terror, describing the impossible creature I'd encountered. They sounded skeptical, of course. It probably came out as the panicked ramblings of an overworked deputy. But I knew what I saw. Still see it, I think, in the quiet of the night when the desert wind whispers through the Joshua trees. I didn't drive home that night. I drove to the nearest town and holed up in a cheap motel room, staring numbly at the flickering TV. My patrol car was found abandoned by the side of Highway 375, windshield shattered, the seat soaked with my own cold sweat. They chalked it up to sleep deprivation, maybe a coyote with mange and a hell of an attitude. Mildred fixed me a strong pot of coffee when I finally stumbled back into her diner, looking more haunted than any ghost story spook tourist. She didn't say a word, just slid the coffee across the counter, her eyes dark and understanding. The other deputies gave me wide berth for a while. I became one of those stories the guy who went a little loco out in the desert. I never told them the full truth, couldn't risk being dismissed as a complete crackpot. I still patrol these desert roads, a little more watchful, a little less sure of what else might be lurking out in those wide-open spaces. And sometimes, on long, quiet nights, I think I catch a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye, a flash of those burning, in human eyes. A shadow falls over my life now, 
a sliver of unease that never fully fades. Some nights, the image of that impossible creature flashes before my eyes as I try to sleep, the memory of its raking claws and burning stare a nightmare I cannot escape. The town whispers, of course. They say I saw a skinwalker, some desert demon of native legend. Others claim it's all some government conspiracy, a test gone wrong out at Area 51. The truth, I fear, is stranger, wilder than any explanation we dare to utter. I try to carry on, try to live a semblance of a normal life. I still answer calls, still pull over speeding motorists, still drink Mildred's sweet tea and eat her greasy, heart-stopping diner breakfasts. But there's a distance now, a distance between myself and the easy familiarity of this small-town life. I see the world through a different lens, tainted by the realization that shadows hold more than just the absence of light. Then, a month later, another call comes in. It's a missing persons report. A pair of hikers, young college kids on some ill-advised adventure off the beaten track. Their gear was found, campsite abandoned, just a few miles from where my encounter took place. The knot of dread in my stomach tightens. I know, somewhere deep down, that those kids aren't coming back. But the responsibility weighs on me as heavy as the desert sun, as unforgiving as the rocky scrubland. The search party assembles deputies, volunteers, guys with rescue dogs that have eyes filled with a heartbreaking hope. I volunteer to lead a team into the foothills, a grim determination in my veins. We find what's left of them two days later. It's a scene straight out of a horror movie, one that would have scoffed at on the silver screen as too gruesome, too unrealistic. Yet here it is, under the indifferent blue sky, the truth that lies beyond campfire tales and conspiracy theories. I don't tell them about the creature. It's pointless. They would write it off as stress, trauma, whatever they need to in order to keep their own perception of the world intact. I simply describe tracks, strange, elongated animal tracks, deeper than any coyote or mountain lion would leave. They nod solemnly, make the official notes, and pack up the tattered remains of those kids with practiced, efficient hands. Later, back at the station, I sit at my desk, staring out the window. Johnson comes in, slaps my shoulder with exaggerated heartiness. Hey, Russ, heard you found our adventurous idiots. Hell of a mess out there, huh? He doesn't wait for a reply, just moves on to gossip about who's sleeping with who down at the saloon. I turn back to the window, a hollow ache in my chest. The desert stretches out beyond the town, vast and implacable. I know those kids aren't the last. The creature, whatever it is, is hungry, and we are the feast laid out under the stars. There's a terror in that knowledge, a gnawing helplessness in the face of an unknown, unpredictable predator. But there's also a hard kernel of resolve solidifying in my gut. The next day, I hand in my resignation. Mildred raises an eyebrow when I stop in for one last cup of coffee but says nothing. I think she understands. Word gets around fast in a small town. Folks avoid my eyes, whisper when I pass. Coward, some call me. Deserter. Maybe they're right. But I can't stay here, can't pretend that things can ever go back to the way they were. What I saw out there shattered that illusion with the brutal force of claws against steel. I pack what little I own into my beat-up old truck, an aimless destination in mind. There's a rumor I heard a while back, whispered among the truckers passing through, of another patch of desert where strange things walk under the moonlight. A place in Texas, near the border, where the land is scarred with arroyos and the shadows hold the whisper of old, dark secrets. It's a flimsy lead, a fool's errand, probably. But it's all I have. I'm not the hero type, never was. 
Yet I also know I can't turn my back on this, this thing that stalks the edge of the world. There's a hunt in my blood now, a drive born of fear and anger and a desperate need to understand the shape of the nightmare that invaded my quiet life. As I pull out of town, the last image of Lincoln County fades in my rearview mirror, Mildred's Diner, its neon sign buzzing, a lone beacon against the encroaching desert dusk. I drive west, the setting sun blazing a path before me. The radio crackles with static, and up ahead, the road stretches on, empty and endless. The aftermath is yet to be written. Maybe I'll find something out there, some other soul who's seen behind the curtain and survived. Or maybe I'll become just another story whispered around a campfire, a cautionary tale about the things you don't want to find, even as you search. But one thing is certain I'm not Russell Yates, small-town deputy, anymore. I'm something else now, something forged in the crucible of that moonlit encounter. I'm a hunter walking the line between the known and the unknown, and I won't stop until I find answers, or until the shadows claim me for good.